Hi, I'm Jeff Nyquist, and this is another edition of Friends and Enemies. This week we are covering uh, part two of World War II. Last week we covered World War II. We uh, covered the beginnings of the war uh, through the fall of Poland, the Blitzkrieg in Scandinavia, the Low Countries, the fall of France, and we touched on the Battle of Britain. So now we are in the latter part of 1940. Uh, Germany has no way of defeating Britain because it can't cross the English Channel. Uh, Hitler went and tried to get Franco into the war so he could close Gibraltar. Italy has declared war, which uh, after when the defeat of France was imminent, Mussolini, who had refused to join Hitler and made all these demands for supplies from Hitler if he were to join, suddenly saw he didn't want to miss his opportunity. He was going to take a chunk of France, and it turns out he had his own designs. And so now at, uh, in the latter part of 1940, we begin with, we, we should probably begin with the Rib, Ribbentrop, Ribbentrop and Hitler meet with Molotov. Molotov comes to Berlin in uh, November of 1940. And uh, this begins to change uh, very outwardly the relationship between Germany and um and the Soviet Union. So maybe you want to comment on that uh, and uh, about this uh, this relationship. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's easier now to uh, try to reconstruct the Russian game plan. Uh, we talked about in the last episode about the um, the orders from Moscow, um, direct, you know, at, for the communists in Germany, uh, they were not allowed to form an alliance with the Social Democrats to slow down uh, the, the Nazi uh, road to power. And th these communists in Germany, they were told in no uncertain terms that the expectation was the Nazi regime would only last two years, maybe maybe, maybe up to five years. The Nazis would uh, fail and then a revolution could take place. But um, we can probably tell that this was a lie, um, that uh, the, the game plan was, was indeed different. The expectation was that Germany exhausts itself, and uh, and at the right moment the Russians would take the initiative. Now these revisionists afterwards they made a big point of um, the Russian preparations for war, and so they make this argument that Hitler had no other choice and this and that. But when we talk about a war of that size, there's always many different options and sub options. So. A, a full-blown assault, a, a full-blown invasion is not the only choice that you have, especially when you can make a deal in, in, in the middle of it. You know, it's, it's not just total defeat or total victory. There's all kinds of, kinds of ways a war like this could end. So um, apparently the Russians were lying to anybody, even to their own people. Um, and uh, uh, judging from the level of intelligence infiltration of Germany, there was, a, I think, an element of confidence on the side of the Russians where they would offer the exact thing that Hitler wanted, that, that deal. And this is sort of the baseline, um, baseline logic of any intelligence service. They want to figure out what the other group or person, what it needs, the, the one thing that they absolutely want and need, and then you pretend to give it to them. Um, but at the same time, the uh, uh, at the same time, the Russians were clearly aware of the the strength of the British, because all as as well the British were infiltrated by Soviet intelligence. So there was a clear view on Europe. The Russians had a clear view, where and the British had a pretty clear view on things, but the Germans did not have uh, that full of a picture. So the Germans they pretty much went in blind into the Soviet Union. Um, in certain areas, and so um, I mean, to me, uh, to me, the Russians were lying to everybody, even to their own people. They had reserve troops that the Nazis were not aware of, um, and the British were still a strong force. Now they barely got away with Dunkirk. The expeditionary force could have been, you know, grabbed and and held hostage. Um, but we're still talking about the British Empire with all its colonies and the bond system. They could finance a war. They could just produce and produce, and of course the Americans um, could supply Britain. So uh, I think it's a difference of how much you could see the situation, how much you know about yourself and the other players, 
and the Germans did not see enough. And uh, I also think that uh, these Soviet agents in Germany at the time, they were feeding a lot of false information and a false picture to the Nazi leadership. So for the Nazis, it seemed like like a, a, a clever deal. I mean, we know from many sources, even Hitler himself, that ultimately he did want to attack the Soviet Union um, at some point. Um, but um, Hitler was he he had options when it when it came to that. So. Of course, the Russians had an attack plan. They always, the Russians always have some sort of attack plans to take over Europe. Um, but uh, it was the, the Russians probably had the best the best picture because the British they knew pretty much all about Germany, but the British didn't know that much about the Russians. I mean, that's the way I I, I see that. There's um there's this fascinating book which really kind of started. Uh, this is Stalin's War by Ernst Topisch. And uh, this book uh, came out in the 1980s. This is the English uh, language edition. Uh, the translation's a little bit awkward, uh, from what I can tell. But the um, but it has uh, it. He really starts out uh, similarly. Uh, Victor Suvorov, who a few years later wrote his Icebreaker, which is I mean, you want want to get a copy of this book? It's probably 300 bucks on uh, Amazon to find one. Maybe more now. Uh, who started the Second World War, and it's uh, it 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 is along with the chief culprit, which is Suvorov's follow-up book to Icebreaker, which came out. Oh, I don't know, was this tw 2012 or 11? Um, this is um, the chief culprit, uh, Stalin's grand design for the Second World War, um, and and it really is Suvorov is has gone into greater detail. Uh, and having access to Soviet sources, um, uh, he shows what Topish, uh, he ver verifies a lot of the, the thinking of Topish. Now, Topish was a German soldier in World War II. He fought in Sixth Army. He ser he did not get captured at Stalingrad. He was wounded or and, and evacuated before the army was trapped. But he'd always thought about his comrades. He'd thought about the, the defeat of the Germans, and he loathed Hitler. Uh, Topish did, and he thought there's something wrong with Hitler's strategic thinking, that Hitler got outwitted, and who outwitted him? Stalin did. And this is why Topish calls it Stalin's war, that Stalin basically could have stopped the war by aligning with the Western allies Early. in 1939, and he did not. He kicked out the French and British delegations out of Moscow, invited Ribbentrop to Moscow, made the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, made Hitler his pal, agreed to divide uh, the East between themselves, divide Poland, and to with Russia getting the Baltic states and be, having access to Finland, while Germany would have then a free hand. And, 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 and Hitler thought that this would make him safe from the British because if he's invading Poland with the Soviet Union, surely the British and the French who had made this agreement to protect Poland wouldn't declare war on Hitler yeah. and Stalin. But Stalin was clever, as Suvorov points out in The Chief Culprit. Uh, it is, uh, you know, Hitler invades Poland on September 1st, the Allies then declare war on what the third is their ultimatum and the fourth they're at war with Germany of September. And then, so there's no declaration of war. And then Hitler's going, but the Soviet Union was supposed to invade with me. Yeah. And saying, where are the Soviet armies? And the reply comes from Moscow, well, we're having some problems organizing the invasion. We need <laughs> a few more days. And of course, the Soviet Union does invade Poland on September the 17th. Right. So it's they when it's safe to say that yeah. Britain and France are at war with Germany and they don't want to declare war in another country. The Soviet Union has invaded Poland. They've promised to protect Poland. But the Soviet Union says, oh, we're, we're basically just invading Poland to keep Hitler from getting those parts of it. <laughs> you know, yeah, small, they tell the allies. small. Yeah. Something something I wanted to mention at this point was um, when we talked about. Uh, we talked about the Putin interview with Tucker Carlson, and we remember that Putin was um, blaming Poland for World War II. Um, I mean, people have to remember how, uh, you know, the situation that Poland was in, they had no way of, uh, 
you know forcing a certain forcing a certain plan onto everybody else you know if, if you're surrounded by by these these different empires um it's just it's just a, a bizarre a bizarre statement when um when this was supposed to be a split of poland so so the nazis would get a piece the russians would get a piece um and and as you said um the you know the the russians they they could have ch they, they, the Russians could have uh, made a, a clear statement, not align with the Nazis and scare off the Nazis because these all these officers and party people with the Nazis they they followed along Hitler's lead because they believed um, they believed that the Soviet Union was going to act a certain way and they believed the British were going to act a certain way. So if you if you fool Hitler and all of his people, then you know this this deception can actually uh, actually work. Yeah, and I should mention, connected to this is a fascinating uh, piece of confirmation of Suvorov and Topish from a British researcher, intelligence writer named William West. And, and maybe, um, maybe, Alex, you know his work. He wrote an important book on the background of Sir Roger Hollis. Because as you know, in the late 80s, yeah. there was the spy catcher scandal where the deputy, the former deputy head of MI5, the British equivalent of the FBI, uh, it's, it's a British counterintelligence domestic service, uh, was accusing his, accused his boss, the head of MI5, Sir Roger Hollis, of being a Soviet agent. And that this explained everything that went wrong during the Cold War for British, Canadian, you know, even in Amer American intelligence to some extent, because we worked with the British. And um, this, in fact, it was the Thatcher government and this book came out in 87, the, the, the Margaret Thatcher government banned the book, Spycatcher. Uh, uh, they, they, they banned it in, and you, so you couldn't, it couldn't be published there. Now I have a copy here. It could be published in the U S I don't know if you've got a copy, if they translated it into German, but the book was a sensation because of this claim. Well, William West decided he really had access to good background information. And Roger Hollis had gone to China and he believed that Roger Hollis, who was not a Cambridge mole, he went to Oxford. So he wasn't a Cambridge guy. He went to the Far East and he believes that, that Hollis got recruited when he was in China yeah. and in the Far East um, in the interwar period. And But Hollis comes back, he ends up joining MI5. Despite not being, being qualified at all. He was not qualified, not qualified to be a regular all. agent. No, no, not qualified at all. And so World War II begins. And of course, what we just said is Hitler is really aligned with Stalin. And the communists in Great Britain, the Communist Party, just like the communists in France. By the way, the communists in France were causing... Uh, unrest in the army, in the French army. They were trying to demoralize. The communists had orders to demoralize the Western powers. And the and what, what West reveals in his book is that the British Communist Party said, we are planning a revolution. We're going to take over Great Britain in the middle of this war, which is fantastic. And Roger Hollis was tasked with watching the British communists yeah and and what what west shows is that he actually had these people a lot of these people were his friends that he was watching but he didn't tell mi6 oh he or, didn't you know he, mi5 yeah, that yeah when he friends. joined when he joined he was not he, he didn't tell them about his communist friends that he had earlier no no and in fact so he was not really he was keeping tabs officially but he always had an excuse for why he wasn't detecting this plot and what's really fascinating and it absolutely dovetails with Suvorov's military claims about Russian war preparations there there was the expectation by the British communists that the Soviet army was going to reach the English channel and would be in a position to intervene in Britain so that the British communists could take over. Mm -hmm. Now, what's fascinating is that Suvorov has this bit in his writings that the Soviet Union was de had developed, be this is before Barbarossa, tanks made to cross the English Channel underwater, right? They were Now, the Germans had developed a similar kind of tank. You put a, like a giant snorkel on it, like a tube yeah. that would run up to the surface that could gather air and pump it into the tank while the tank crawled along the bottom of the 
of the seafloor, the seabed. And of course, the English Channel is not that deep. So you can you 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 can just drive the tank, and of course the oxygen f feeds oxygen into the engine, so that you could have have the engine function because that needs oxygen for the internal combustion of the diesel engine. But also the crew could breathe, and the exhaust could be carried out, and so that they could have tank regiments that could go along. And and so why would then this is Suvorov's question? Why would the Soviet army be developing tanks to cross the English Channel if they were loyal allies of um, of Germany. Yeah. And the other thing people never talk about was Stalin's massive naval construction program. And in fact, Russia was building two of the largest battleships. I think they would have, I think they would have dwarfed the Bismarck for sure. Hmm these super battleships that, that the Soviet Union was building and, and massive naval construction plans. Why would the Soviet Union be building this giant navy at the same time? Which, by the way, the German invasion in 1941 uh, caused uh, Stalin to abandon this naval construction because he needed the sailors and the workers immediately to defend Leningrad because the Germans came up on it so quickly. So you have this uh, William West showing this, and, and Suvorov makes an additional point about the BT-7 tank. Uh, the, the Russians were developing tanks that you could remove the tread from the tank and put inflatable tires on the wheels that it was convertible so that it could go 60, 70 miles an hour on the Autobahn, right? So it's a tank, and in Russia, there's no, there's except for just around Moscow and in in Donbas, there's not a lot of paved roads in the Soviet Union back then. You know, there weren't paved roads connecting any of the major cities except maybe Tula and Moscow, um, and and some of the cities in the Donbas. You know, so why would you make a tank that had this capability of operating on a paved road unless you were planning to invade? Germany. And the same thing, he goes through the design of the Soviet Air Force. Um, um, the, the design was they made their aircraft for attack and their fighters for attacking German bases and German aircraft on the ground, not for defending their own planes on the ground, not for fighter air defense, but for offense. And the Soviet Army, in fact, when it was positioned on the border with Nazi Germany in 1941 was not, they were not digging trenches in defensive positions. They were assembled in offensive formations yeah. largely with some exceptions in, in like in the far north of the line. But this is the way they were deploying. And this evidence Suvorov uses in both of his books to make a very strong case that the Soviet Union was preparing to attack Nazi Germany. And this of course goes back to the Again, the November 1940 meeting where Molotov comes to Moscow. And it was at this meeting that Molotov, Hitler wants this, you know, Soviet Union to join the war in earnest and to attack India. And Molotov wouldn't hear of it and is saying, why don't you hand over Finland? Hitler needs the nickel, I think, in Finland, if I'm remembering correctly. And he wants Bulgaria and he wants the Turkish Straits. So... Hitler is taken aback, and at this meeting, um, and we have um, the uh, testimony of the translator who was there, famously saying that Hitler was very friendly, Ribbentrop was very friendly, they were basically very nice to Molotov, but Molotov was kind of snotty and cold and demanding in yeah. return. Did you want to make any comments about this meeting? Um, I don't remember that meeting particularly, uh, particularly, but um, this was sort of the the dream that the Russians have had for for a long time to have that that invasion of of Europe. And we talked about this about World War One, uh, when Russia failed. You know, they had all this preparation. They had a deal with the British, had a deal with the French, and uh, the idea was to you know push through Poland and grab as much of Germany as possible. And um, but ultimately. As we know, Russia Russia failed in this, and they had to uh, they had to give away territories. They had to formally give away Ukraine. Um, but this was the second large attempt that was um, 
that was prepared you know just to to finally uh set these things right for you know from moscow's perspective um and um when we look at when we look at the the german uh the german plan of punching into uh punching into russia um it's sort of um it, the only the only advantage really that the germans had was the speed and uh the russians of course they could always do what they've always done have a, a flexible retreat system just like with napoleon just lure the enemy in and and wait and see but um the speed of the germans had surprised the french uh the speed had surprised the british um uh, because everybody was on amphetamines you know everybody was was just working like crazy for for sometimes for days without sleep and so that was the only advantage really that the germans had because they were at a disadvantage in terms of um uh, production they were at a disadvantage in terms of um the intelligence uh, sphere so really the only um, the only solution for the Germans would have been to follow the initial plan of Heinz Guderian and his colleagues to just punch into Russia and go straight for Moscow and uh, take out the centers of command and the war production or take over the Russian war production because uh, th that was sort of the only the only way of uh, of countering um, or the, the only way of doing this, really. I mean, the Germans were not really aware of the Russian preparations uh, in, in full, um, but the Russians were probably taken by surprise, um, you know, when it comes to the German speed of advancing. And this this is something we saw with on various fronts in the war, you know, with the, the Africa Corps and Rommel, you know, they, they were crazy about speed. And Rommel had learned this even earlier, in uh, even early in France, when he was uh, he was uh, uh, stationed in France, they were overrunning, literally overrunning the French positions, and this sort of became a almost a com competitive um, uh, thing with the German officers who gets there first. And uh, the French were taken by surprise so much that sometimes they thought these German troops were French troops because nobody expected the Germans to be that fast. And also, at some point. Uh, somebody like Rommel was so fast um, in the north of France, he actually left behind his, his support troops and he came under fire because he was just shooting uh, forward um, that fast. And uh, it was it was uh, it was a smart move by the Russians to have um, that amount of preparation without the Germans knowing. Um, but um, I think the Russians truly underestimated the the German speed they could they could come up with. Yeah, they definitely did. The German speed was huge, and and of course Hitler had this understanding that he he knew he had a very capable military machine, more capable. Everyone underestimated. You know, the Germans weren't as well prepared for World War II as they were for World War One. Their divisions didn't have adequate artillery. Von Manstein even admits this. He said that the, the Western Allies, when they attacked, were equal or in some areas superior to the Germans, except in morale and except in the leadership of the units. And then, of course, the doctrine, the, the ideas that they were following, the German officers had superior ideas of how to fight. Um, and, of course, this idea of getting behind the enemy punching a hole in the line and getting behind and disrupting the communications and the command and control and causing the enemy total confusion with mobile units in the rear was absolutely devastating to the French and the British. And it was extremely successful, this Blitzkrieg. And it was going to prove even more successful, more devastating against the Soviets. Only the Soviet Union had so much territory. It had so many armies and so much depth. Yeah. It could lose army after army. Um, in fact, the Germans took more prisoners uh, in in the first stages of the war than they had themselves soldiers, captured uh, more tanks than they had tanks um, from the Russians to show you uh, the power of the Blitzkrieg, but also the tremendous yeah. resources oh, by the way, of the uh, Soviet I Union. There was something. There was something super important you mentioned in the last episode, and that was the uh, when uh, Lenin pretty much was aware in his day his day and age that there would be another great war um and uh and that's also that also explains why stalin was so 
adamant with the collectivization and the industrialization and he wouldn't care how many people um were killed along the way or or put in a gulag along the way it was that kind of speed because they all were aware they were planning or at the top they were aware they were planning another great war and when the when when you know around the year 19 1940 1941 the soviet union was kind of mature as an empire whereas the nazis were not they just barely had managed to come out of this economic recession they had overcome some of these obstacles but a lot of the administrative structures were not mature yet with the nazis and of course the espionage was total garbage um they didn't have decades of cleaning their own ranks training these people and getting this expertise and making everything function because um when uh even when when Barbarossa was about a year old, you know, when the the the, the attack was one year in or t- almost two years in, the German economy uh, was was not yet transferred to a true war economy. It, it sounds crazy, but that's what it was. And even the efficiency of the production was not there. Now, some people think that the German system, you know, the the war production was working like a Swiss clock, but it wasn't. And um, that was something I think that goes back to how mature is an empire. I mean, the British were very mature. America was was well established because they had this. Um, America has had this. Uh, America has had this great industrial push in the ni- in the eighteen seventies and eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties. And the structures uh, of America, the administration, that was working fairly well. And we saw this, of course, later in the Second World War when America was able to uh, mobilize like 12 million soldiers and all this equipment. And they were outproducing everybody else. So I think the, the, the maturity of an empire speaks volumes about what it can do. And originally, I mean, before Barbarossa, Hitler assured uh, his people and basically lied to his people that um, there was going to be a, a big pause after Poland and Sweden and, you know, the, the oil fields in the south. There would be a great pause where Germany could mature as an empire and and solidify the gains that had been made. And Hitler was telling everybody, I'm not going to live that long. My successor will, or my successors, plural, will uh, solidify what I have won and then we'll see. And there were these plans that Hitler talked about in his second book. He was planning for these multiple stages. And I think in the, by the 1980s, he was uh, planning, the plan was to attack America finally. Um, but you can see that, that the German system, the German empire wanted to mature in stages, but they didn't have the time to do so. And you can see that in many instances, even before Barbarossa, because um, it's almost like a bad comedy. When you look at Albert Speer's memories, who was just an architect, right? And then he became responsible for the war production. I mean, even even these these assignments were comedic almost. And then when you look at um, the descriptions by Albert Speer about how decisions were made, you had to be close to Hitler. You had He had to like you. You had to talk to him in a specific way. And you could only get things done by being in that circle and then, of course, be the this later this later problem that I will talk about later, when the flow of information to Hitler and from Hitler was managed by uh, Lamas, Keitel, and Bormann. So it's almost comedic and insane if you think about it. Whereas the Russian system was mature, it worked, um, and they could give orders, and these orders were followed. And the British, they've had hundreds of years of experience. And one of the reasons that the administratively the Third Reich was weak, and it's a reason why the Russian Federation is weak under Putin, because Putin actually follows Hitler's practice in this way, is that Hitler liked his subordinates to have overlapping areas of responsibility so that they would conflict with each other. And yeah. it was Hitler's insurance policy to make sure everyone would have to come to him. So that what what Hitler did was he he would make sure they would conf- his his subordinates would all be in conflict with each other so rather than cooperating and being forced to follow uh, a, a common blueprint he wanted them at each other's throats so that they would need him to mediate between them and this is a this is very typical of many dysfunctional dic- dictatorial regimes where there's a kind of insecurity in the part of the leader 
who he doesn't quite trust everybody, so it's better for them to all distrust each other more. Oh, yeah. And this, of course, created a lot of dysfunction in the Third Reich. Oh, especially um, the especially the Gauleiters. That's what they call these regional um, administrators in in Nazi Germany. Um, Hitler always had an issue with the Gauleiters, and they were quite powerful. And even Speer, when he was running the war economy. The war production, he, he was constantly facing this backlash from these Gauleiters. Um, and, and it's it's really hard to reconstruct how these um, how limited the uh, these people in what a limited way these people could even make decisions. Because remember, the Nazis were so immature when this w was path to power was happened. Everybody was collecting incriminating material on everybody, and and there was this weird dynamics. So many people they couldn't even make certain decisions or agree with certain decisions because somebody had leverage on them. And you know this guy liked that guy more, and this guy was totally out of tune with reality. And it's just like it's it's almost like a dark comedy when 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 you look back at yeah. it. And so Hitler was did not rule in the same style that Stalin did. And Stalin, of course, had created through his purges, he had created this fear amongst the, his subordinates that if they displeased him, so they knew they were serving him, obedience to him was absolute. Any attempt to deceive the leader or to even irritate him risked going to the gulag or being executed so that this system... It, it, it functioned. Now, the, this system has dysfunction in it, too, because if everybody below you is scared of you and they're scared, they're, that means they're scared to tell you the truth because and, maybe and they'd the rather do nothing than do the wrong thing. It's what we see in China right. today where they become passive and they just don't do anything. Well, because if they do something and it turns out to be wrong... Uh, they could be executed. There's a famous story of Stalin. This is after the war. There was a movie producer. Stalin went on vacation, and this producer had this film. He had to make a decision. He had a deadline how to make the ending of the film, how to make it. And he thought, oh, no, I, I can't reach Stalin. I can't find out what he wants, right? So he just guessed. And he gets called on the carpet. The film comes out. Stalin comes back from vacation. And so he's sitting, this, this poor guy, this film producer, sitting in this, this uh, room where there's some Soviet officials there. And Stalin's coming from behind a curtain. And um, Stalin peeks out from the curtain. Oh, you went and made the end of the film without consulting me. And the poor guy is just trembling. You bastard. And he's saying, you guessed the end of the film. Oh, no. And then he, 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 and then he comes in and he sits down and he goes, and you're very lucky. You guessed right. Oh, <laughs> no. Like, What's behind door yes. number two? Oh, it's execution. <laughs> Behind door yeah. number two is execution. You picked wrong. But here's yeah. some... And and here's some yeah, and here's something else. I mean, in, in 1939, the United States um, lowered their stance about neutrality because they they were informed about what was going on fairly well. So it, uh, starting in 1939, the United States uh, decided that it would, it would give military surplus to Germany's enemies. Now, this is when the United States gets involved, right? And still... The war economy of Germany was um, the war economy of Germany was still very dysfunctional because Hitler insisted prices cannot rise for the consumers. These consumer goods have to be produced. Everybody's supposed to be happy. Everybody's supposed to love me. Um, and uh, and Speer was discovering all sorts of madness in in the production. He looked at various factories and he noticed that they were not even producing around the clock. They they could do more shifts, but they didn't do that. There was a, a, a serious lack of workers uh, in the war production. And also, um, sometimes these goods were not ordered in large enough quantities to justify a machine production, a, a larger scale machine production. Some of these goods, artillery shells, other, this was still made the old way. And so he was uh, pulling all kinds of strings, Albert Speer, and he managed to improve the output by 60% in a very short amount of time. Now, this is even when America was starting to ship military surplus to Germany's yeah. enemies. Yeah. it's um, So anyway, so I should talk about the Ribbentrop um, 
the result of this Ribbentrop uh, uh, Hitler meeting with Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister. But I, I should first document uh, in Topish's book, he has some cables showing the attitude of the the Soviet government, and um, and this these these attitudes are are quite amazing. Molotov in 1940 at a meeting with the uh, foreign minister uh, of uh, Lithuania um, made a remarkable statement. Um, and uh, I think somehow my thing got in the wrong. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, they, uh, here it is. Uh, this is what he says to the Lithuanian foreign minister in on June 30th, 1940. We are now more than ever convinced that our brilliant comrade Lenin made no mistake when he asserted that the Second World War would enable us to seize power in Europe, Oops. just as we did in Russia after the First World War. For this reason, you should be starting now to introduce your people into the Soviet system which in future will rule all Europe. Okay. There so this go. is the, the foreign minister of the then neutral Lithuania, which was around this time absorbed by the Soviet Union when it took the Baltic states. Um, and so this is, this is a, a, a whole, about a year before Hitler attacks the Soviet Union, Molotov is basically telling this Lithuanian foreign minister, we're going to own Germany. We're going to not only rule your country, we're going to rule Germany and all of Europe because Lenin had this brilliant idea. And of course, this is the proof that Stalin was going to stab Hitler in the back. And of course, the idea that Hitler didn't know this, Hitler figured it out when he, Hitler only needed that meeting with Molotov to catch on because Hitler was very sensitive to power relationships. Some of his generals, I think it was Keitel who commented, Hitler had this amazing sixth sense when it came to power relationships, what they really were. And Hitler realized that making a deal with Stalin, he realized in November 1940 that Stalin didn't intend to keep it. Now, maybe Hitler down the road didn't intend to to keep yeah. it with Stalin, but Stalin had the idea of betraying him much earlier on in the relationship. Oh and yeah, Hitler of course, because the, because the Russian game plan was much older than the German game plan, and that that makes more a long difference. range. Yeah, yeah, it was it was conceived earlier, and and Hitler was a bit of an opportunist, as uh, Topish points out. Hitler was an amateur when it came to international diplomacy. He really didn't understand what he was doing when he made his alliance with Stalin. He didn't realize that he was putting himself in a position to be exploited by Stalin later on, because here he was, Hitler was then in 19, late 1940, he was at war with Great Britain. Spain would not help him uh, because, you know, he thought, well, he helped. You couldn't count Franco on the Italians. The Civil war. You couldn't count and on the, the Italians. And the Italians were worthless. No, I'm talking about Spain would not help yeah. him. Take and Gibraltar Italy, and and Italy was men. useless. Yeah. <laughs> and Italy was useless because we should mention what happened uh, in in late 1940 is that um, Mussolini conceived of taking over Greece. And he invaded Greece through Albania, which he had taken over, I think, in 1939, if I'm remembering correctly. He invaded Greece through Albania, and the Greeks defeated the Italian army and chased it back into the Albanian mountains, <laughs> where they spent the winter of 1940 freezing. Um, I, I mean, the winter of 1941 freezing. Uh, and and this created a, a crisis for Hitler because now Greece, because it was attacked by his ally Mussolini, was an allied country. The British sent troops into Greece. And now he had this problem of the allied of an allied country with British troops on the continent. Uh, threatening his flank if he was going to invade the Soviet Union. And this is what he had decided after his meeting with Molotov in November 1940, in December, he met with his generals and he said, I have to invade the Soviet Union because they, this is Stalin is not somebody we can do business with anymore. Uh, Stalin is clearly going to act against us. He's already pushing on us and we can't give him what he wants, what he's demanding. So Hitler gave the order then in December and I think most his historians agree that that is when he, f 
he had contemplated said you know you know think yeah. about invading the soviet union but he would never this was the concrete we're gonna do it we're gonna attack oh, them and in the just spring. To, just just to add one more thing um be, through this through this um uh ribbentrop molotov pact the nazis were scaring the crap out of the japanese now we can't go into all the the asian theater because it's such a huge chapter but um it, this was also a weird strategic diplomatic move Uh, which ultimately led the Japanese to adjust uh, their own plans. Uh, yes, this was, in this fact, was so this dumb. is where Hit Hitler outmaneuvered himself with the Japanese because what he did was by making the military... See, remember, Japan and Germany were in the anti common turn pact, They which is an anti-communist pact, right? They loved each other. Right, so you had Germany, Italy, and Japan... Uh, ostensibly agreed. And so this, at the same time, they are surrounding the Soviet Union. You got Japan is not only an island then, they controlled Man, uh, Manchuria. Manchuria. And of course, the Soviets controlled Mongolia. And of course, there's the German, the the the, the, um, uh, the Japanese Kwangtung army in Manchuria, which is one of the more powerful Japanese armies watching the Soviets. And of course, This is a threat. And in fact, there was a battle fought in 1939 at Kalkan Gull, where the Japanese actually invaded Mongolia, Soviet Mongolia. They crossed into the Soviet Union, and um, there was this prolonged battle. I believe it was August of 1939. And they were actually defeated by Georgi Zhukov, who used tanks and airplanes. And of course, the Japanese did not try this again on the Soviets. So, so the, the, the problem was is that, and of course, when this battle happened in August, there's when Hitler goes and makes this deal with the Soviet Union, yeah. which of course the Japanese are going, hey, wait a minute, we were, you were going to go east and we were going to go west and we were going to meet, you know, their idea was <laughs> we're going to squeeze because the Japanese army was kind of in favor of war with the Soviet uh, Union at the time. There were Japanese Uh, people that wanted this, wanted to do this, Japanese military leaders. Yeah. And, it's and of course, so Stalin yeah. was in trouble. But what the consequence was, monkey see, monkey do, when Hitler had a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, the Japanese went and got a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union too. Yeah, that was that was the situation. And also, um, the the Americans and the British, they were able to analyze the situation fairly well so the 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 anglos they knew fairly well what um the german generals were thinking and planning but ultimately hitler made the decisions so there's an example here uh oberbefehlshaber erich reda was suggesting to uh to hit suez to 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 be active in, in suez to secure the oil and cut off the brits and to calm down the turks and the american uh, uh the american Uh, general staff american general staff member marshall he was expecting exactly that because it was military logic but of course the, the uh the uh the the germans made some weird weird decisions that was um kind of catching many people uh many people by surprise um and uh so these these experts were seeing one thing but hitler was seeing something uh hitler was seeing something else and um heinz guderian and his colleagues they were coming up with this elaborate plan to punch into the soviet union take moscow take st petersburg and and have the centers of power and the centers of the russian war production um but then hitler came up with his own plan which was very very different you know he was um targeting the periphery he was you know, going north and going south and then at some later point they were going to go against moscow but the initial plan uh was about hitting moscow when it was warm which of course would have been the logical well, choice yeah, the thing is a, a country with what at that time uh 11 time zones 12 time zones because they had ukraine and belarusia then Uh, 12 time zones so this is a country that's covering half the time zones right? mm -hmm. um, this is an incredible thing you're going to conquer it of course most of to be fair most of uh the soviet union its industry and its population was in european russia and ukraine 
and Belarus. That's where most of it was. So if you did conquer that part, Siberia and the Caucasus in the south didn't amount to enough to really probably resist. So that that is a fair point. Um, but we should then mention that in this period, two intervening events then happened. Uh, one was Hess's trip to the UK, which you should talk about, uh, his his flight to Scotland to try to make a separate peace with the UK. And here Hess, the number three guy in the Third Reich, is gets in a plane and, and, and flies, a specially modified plane, flies to Scotland, parachutes, crashes the plane, parachutes out so he can meet the Duke of Hamilton. And you, you have, as well at the same time, Yugoslavia, uh, under its monarchy, was going to join the Axis was going to be part of the Axis. And of course, Hitler needed to get troops down to Greece to help Mussolini. But then there's a there's a political change of power. There's like a coup in Belgrade where a pro-allied uh, faction takes over and there's Topish has evidence that Stalin is meeting with representatives of this new Yugoslavian government, encouraging them to resist the Nazis, although he's doing nothing to help Yugoslavia in practical terms. He wants them to tie Hitler up. So maybe you could talk about these two events, especially the 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 Hess trip to well, Scotland. Hess was super close, super close to Hitler, and his public role um, eventually became reduced. But he was working behind the scenes, and his value was not just um, a, a personal value to Hitler, but also. Um, this this network with the Anglo's. Um, I think um, there needs to be more work done on this because not everything has been discovered to this Hess point. Hess was was born in Egypt, by the way. Yeah, uh, which is interesting to note. And he was an Anglophile. He was going to go to was it Oxford or Cambridge? He was going to attend, but World War One got in the way of that. Am I yeah. remembering that correct? Yeah, exactly. something along those lines, and yeah. uh, I, I remember something along those lines. And uh, Hess, he was, um, he was, he was. And initially, he had a big, bigger public role, but that role was reduced. He was not supposed to be uh, in public that much, and um, he was having this connection with the Haushofer clan, the elder Haushofer who was developing his geopolitics concept, and the younger Haushofer, who also had very um, intricate ties to Britain. Now. Um, the younger Haushofer, Haushofer's contacts in Britain uh, possibly reached into the personal realm because um, uh, Hess, Hess was most likely uh, very gay and the young Haushofer was possibly very gay and, and they had this, these British contacts they wanted to meet and there was probably some sort of a romantic relationship uh, mixed in between and we all know, you know in later decades how much um, espionage was tied into um, these personal affairs and especially homosexuals because they had their own their own realm and and they this this also this all melted together you know the espionage and the personal and so uh, the expectation of the Nazis was that um, they could achieve not just uh, a, a, a change in the uh, with the throne of Britain put their favorite candidate on the throne or back on the throne. But there was also going to be a political change. And this is what Hitler told his people for a long time, even before Barbarossa. And this was probably an argument of why they could do it or should do it, because they expected a massive change in Britain, a new king who was pro-Nazi and a new government that was pro-Nazi. And there were also there were more many more um, people involved. This is um, uh, the story is told, for example, by Lou Kilzer in his book Churchill's Deception. There were many aristocratic Brit Britain, uh, British who served in the Air Force, you know, a very high position in the Air Force, for example. And there were these constant visits. So they would always fly over. You know, these Brits were flying to Germany. Germans would fly to, to Britain. So this was a common thing to have that direct line of, of communication and travel. Um, and the Nazis, they always wanted to... The Nazis always wanted to develop that relationship. They were inviting these British over, you know, from the Air Force, for example. They didn't know that this Air Force guy was also a spy, you know, for, for MI6 or SIS, what it was called back then. And um, so this British man would come to Germany. He was treated very well. And the Germans would show all these secret plans to him to, to create that bond of trust. And, um, uh, and Hitler was 
happily using his aristocrats to um, work in secret diplomacy because um, Hitler had no experience in diplomacy and the regular um, diplomatic corps was already riddled with these aristocrats. But he also had a separate batch of aristocrats who were, you know, had family ties to Britain. And he would constantly use them and trust them. So th just traveling like this Hess, this Hess flight to Britain was nothing unusual um, for the most part, but it was not so you know usual at that stage of the war. Well, it's so unusual in that the third highest ranking Nazi flies during time of, of war. all these secrets. In a fighter plane, of course, Hess was a flyer in World War I. Um, flies to the enemy country and parachutes there to make a secret to try to he, what he was trying to do is make a uh, peace between Britain and Germany before because this was May 1941 this was a month before Barbarossa this is early May yeah. 1941 Barbarossa Hitler goes to war with the Soviet Union in June and Hess must have known this and, and going there to urgently try to make a peace agreement because then Germany wouldn't be in a two-front war if that agreement's made. And I should, as far as uh, the, the, the King Edward VIII, I should, we should clarify this for the people. King George V died in January 1936, and Edward VIII, Edward becomes the king, and Edward had its – it's, believed to have Nazi, you yeah. know, favorable view of Hitler, right? And I don't know, is that, do you take that to be true or was he just pretending? I mean, how do you it's, it's, take I that? Mean, some of these, uh, some of these parts of this grand deception maneuver, I think worked best if even some aristocrats that were involved were not fully loop in the loop so if you have like this this cadre of people because you know the the previous king you know from the house of hannover they had german roots of course um but um these um it's n the the person on the throne is not necessarily the most powerful of these aristocrats because if you're on the throne you have all these tasks you have to do visit all these places um so it's difficult to see who was more powerful with these aristocrats than somebody else and and some of these aristocrats they played theater very well uh they knew full well what they were doing but i don't think i don't think all of these aristocrats knew what they were doing because um that um that deception would work better if um if uh some people are actually out of the loop and this this whole this whole conspiracy narrative that's been around for 50 years no it was actually it was more like 70 70 80 years at this point the conspiracy ideology played a part and also this um the new trendy um eugenics you know racial purity and have like a world of just Aryans running around, Nordic people running around, that made a great impression. So if if you cultivate these narratives for eighty years, you know, because the the right wing picked up the conspiracy narrative roughly in the in the eighteen fifties, if you cultivate that long enough, it's starting to stick uh, really well. And 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 if you look at the pre Nazi right wing extremist groups in Germany, um, a lot of them got money from aristocrats, and um, some of these aristocrats they. Uh, they they became sort of suspicious um, around World War One because their family ties to Britain were so strong. But even before World War One, um, these aristocrats would often even change their names. They would abandon the British name and they would uh, have a German name, and they would start to get involved in these right wing extremist groups. You know, hating the Jews and you know the purity of the race and all that. Um, and uh, so part of it was was just theater and strategic posturing but some of it actually stuck because these aristocrats had a high degree of of racial ideas you know because you know the 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 hanofa guys you know king king george number five and his predecessors this this is the welfen cluster that goes back to the year 800 and they became more powerful starting from the year 800 roughly so they were very very in tune with a racial ideology they would marry their cousins and then they would grow and grow uh to this ridiculous degree so to many it seemed kind of natural and uh with with edward the eighth he may have believed uh, he was he was uh, just following you know this racial idea and having all these having this triple alliance. This is what Hitler also talked about in his first book, Mein Kampf. 
he wanted for a for a specific time wanted to have like three three empires left in the world the americans the british and the germans and and really nobody else of any uh significance yeah, so I, it's, it's i should it's, mention it works it yeah. works it works if everybody if you know it works if if everybody in this group plays this theater very well but it works even better if if a, a portion of of them these aristocrats actually believe it themselves yeah, I should mention that Edward VIII, of course, uh, fell in love with an American. Um, I think Wallace her name was Simpson. Simpson. Yeah, and um, it was kept secret, although American gossip papers knew about it. She was a, getting a divorce, and the, it was kind of kept out of the British press. But he, uh, the Church of England, was dead set against him uh, having a friendship with a divorcee, let alone marrying one, which it seemed that was his intention. So. He abdicated. He he abdicated the throne because he basically for love, um, and uh, of course this was for those who really were afraid of Nazi Germany. I think this was a relief to some of them, and of course he went to Austria immediately after turning down the throne, and in and then he waited a decent interval till Simpson got the divorce. He married her. And he visited Adolf Hitler in um, October 1937, met with Adolf Hitler, and um, and of course was celebrated by Nazi officials and so yeah. on. And we should uh, mention that when the war broke out, after the fall of France, Edward went to Madrid, Spain. And this is where the crazy Ribbentrop thought up this harebrained plan, which uh, I think it was thought to be a harebrained plan by uh, uh, Heydrich, the head of, uh, of the SD, of, uh, of German Security and Intelligence Services, the SS Intelligence Services. Uh, and they tasked Walter Schellenberg, who was not yet the head of, a, of foreign intelligence, SS foreign intelligence, to go to Madrid and kidnap Ed, a friendly kidnapping of Edward to bring him to Germany because they had the idea in 1940 that if they did defeat uh, England, one of the conditions would be that Edward would return to the throne. Yeah. This was the kind of concept yeah. they had, which was Ribbentrop scheme. You, you, you were talking about Hess going to Scotland and trying to negotiate a peace. Oh, by the way, here you I, had this scheme I forget, to kidnap yeah. Edward, the former king of England. Uh, yeah. Before I forget, before I forget this point, because I think it's important for people to know, um, Ribbentrop himself. I don't, I don't think he was. Uh, I wrote about it in one of my books. He was not a genuine aristocrat himself, but he loved aristocracy and he surrounded himself with aristocrats and he tried to live like them. So he was surrounded by people that possibly likely spied for Britain and the British. He was a he was a champagne salesman, wasn't he? Famously? Yeah, some, yeah, something like yeah. And uh, and the British for centuries they had this massive problem with the British islands because once the British islands get overrun where do you escape America uh, and play the second fiddle or the colonies and try again you could never get back into Europe again and so this problem had been around uh, you know when when Napoleon did his uh, his his invasions and Napoleon at some point even considered invading the British British uh, islands and um, so in World War II or bef even before World War Two, and even before World War One, this theater of the British to to play, you know, to to do this propaganda game with the Germans and with the conspiracy ideology, that theater was baseline survival. And and some people wrote about it in in a more detailed fashion. For example, um, Professor Carol Quigley wrote about this in in one of his books, the the shorter one, not the massive one, and uh, and Quigley. He he always maintained that he he loved the Anglo the Anglo way of life the Anglo culture, but quickly said there was this there were these secret levels within Britain and they make these decisions that can prove to be disastrous. So for example, he always complained that the British should have um, taken a stand early on when Nazi Germany was still forming and when it was still weak. If the British had had not done the appeasement and if the British had coordinated with the French and all of that maybe maybe you know the situation would have oh, gone Hitler a lot would better have, yeah absolutely yeah. I mean this um, this biography of William 
Wilhelm Canaris, the head of the uh, German military intelligence. Oops, got it upside down. Uh, it's a very good one. It's one of the earlier ones. There's a latter one that goes over a lot of the same material with more recent things. But um, uh, Canaris literally, as I mentioned last week, he was going to overthrow Hitler during the Czech crisis in 1938. And it was all the ducks were lined up. It was going to happen. But when, Ch when uh, Chamberlain announced he was going to Germany yeah. to meet with, with Herr Hitler, um, it all came undone. Oh yeah. And also, Hitler, of course, when Hitler got what he yeah. wanted, there the the conspiracies of the generals to overthrow him didn't then regenerate yeah. until you have the July plot in uh, in July 20, 1944, right. which is late in the war when they're losing. So um, yeah, they and don't, of course the, they the generals, yeah. the, the generals. I mean, most of the generals. I think even two thirds or three quarters of the generals uh, in Germany, they were all aristocratic uh, from these old families. And so they had these back channels. They were always back, aristocratic back channels yeah. to Britain, and they were desperately trying. Uh, they were desperately trying to get some sort of a public statement of Britain. You know that they would. Um, uh, mostly, it was uh, Britain was supposed to say in public they would not attack Germany if there was a change in the German power structure because the generals they wanted to get rid of Hitler, either kill him or you know ban him to his favorite mountain. And come up with some story, and there may have been, uh, there there may have resulted a, a German civil war, and they always wanted to get a public confirmation of Britain that they would not intervene, they would not seize the opportunity and attack Germany. But none of these statements ever came. They not nothing ever happened. Yeah, in fact, appeasement strengthened Hitler's hand and made uh, gave Hitler prestige that he wouldn't have otherwise had because then suddenly he was the statesman that had won this territory without a war for Germany. And this was extremely popular to to have leveraged this, and this meant the Germans could not, the German generals could not go against him because he had been right, yeah, and he had done something right, right, thanks to Chamberlain helping him out, and Mussolini mm. played a role in that, by the way. Mussolini, uh, Mussolini actually suggested when it was falling apart, when the whole Munich process was falling apart, let's do it again, let's let's recommit to this, so. Um, you know, it, it, uh, this is the problem when you negotiate with a crazy dictator. Uh, and, and people should think of this in terms of a, a lesson, which I think the Ukrainians and some Europeans understand oh, yeah. regarding Putin today, oh, yeah. is that you don't want to sit down with this guy because you are going to strengthen him tremendously within his own country oh, yeah. I, if I just, you give uh, him what he wants. That's, you know? ex that's exactly the point because I, yesterday I was yesterday I was um, I was doing an interview with uh, somebody from somebody from France and. He was asking me about the, the French position and may France in the near future uh, leave NATO? Could Germany leave NATO or could they suspend membership or some 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 deal like that? And I said, well, um, the, the French, they were hedging their bets multiple times in history. But now today, if you make the wrong decision, you will never be able to correct that mistake. And uh, we saw this in before the ukraine invasion so many countries they they were giving these weird signals we're not going to intervene we're going to forgive russia we're just going to punish them by you know giving them a slap on the wrist and we're just going to you know uh, trust in their willingness to cooperate and it was giving all the wrong signals even though it it's uh, it should have been made clear from the very beginning that um, these these borders cannot be touched. You know, we're not living in that age anymore. That that was supposed to be the message. But um, uh, with Carol Quigley, I mean, Quigley, he was um, Professor Quigley was able to look at these papers from the 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 roundtable groups. You know, the Cecil Rhodes group and and all that and. And so he was trying to make the point that he 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 loved the Anglo realm, but he didn't trust their ability anymore to make these secret decisions in these mm -hmm. circles that were so secret nobody was even supposed to know that they existed. Um, because there's always even something more deep and more deep and more deep. You know, it, it was yeah. hard to get into MI5 and MI6 like like um, Roger Hollis. Because officially it didn't even exist. The the existence was supposed to be kept secret. So you had to know right. people. You had to get into MI5. But there were levels above MI5. And there were levels above, you know, um, Cecil Rhodes's group and all that. So um, yeah. that was the point that Carol Quigley made. 
And of course, this point got twisted by conspiracy literature, especially the John Birch Society. They try to make it appear as if um, Quigley was some sort of a, a conscious member of the conspiracy. And he was bragging about the conspiracy and he was talking about this should be more open. And But this was a complete distortion of what Quigley actually said. He was warning people about the appeasement, about the circles that um, were responsible for the appeasement. And so people should be more transparent in the, in the British uh, system because if there's no transparency, more bad decisions of that nature could res result. And we see this with Russia in the 1990s um, and the way Britain handled Russia in the 1990s and uh, the 2000s. You saw the British monarchs in the 90s, I think it was even in 91 or something, these British monarchs, they were visiting St. Petersburg and, and everything was so nice and all this Russian money was allowed to flow into the city of London. It was a disaster. It was exactly what, yeah. what uh, Quigley had warned about. Yeah, it's, it's you, you, you have a problem when you have a free system and you're dealing with a dictatorship, you have a problem that if you do the wrong thing, you strengthen. Dictatorships are by nature weak because there's no outlet for popular discontent. If you increase the prestige of a dictator like uh, Hitler or like Putin or like Xi, you strengthen their ability to oppress their own people and commit cr crimes domestically, but also to commit aggression abroad. And this is what they did. They basically enabled Hitler uh, without really realizing the damage they were doing, and they realized too late. And so anyway, getting back to uh, Hess's trip to England, the big question has always been whether Hitler authorized this trip of Hess to England. And it is to me inconceivable that Hess yeah. would have gone off half cocked on his own. And I, I cite two authorities on this. Christa Schroeder, Hitler's uh, senior secretary, and um, uh, his uh, – uh, his, his valet, Heinz Linge. If you read their memoirs, and these people, day to day, Heinz Linge was with Hitler every day of, of the war, of this whole thing. And Christa Schroeder, the same thing. They had their days off, of course, but these people worked very long hours right next to Hitler. They knew him, and both of them say in their memoirs, that they simply didn't believe Hitler put on this big act when it became public. See, because Hess's arrival in England was supposed to be a secret. He was going to do these secret negotiations. And if he succeeded, it would just be announced. That would have been right? the biggest, were, biggest sensation in, in, in modern history. I mean, just, just by doing that mental experiment, if, if Hess had succeeded, if the British had aligned with the, with the Germans, um, this could have changed everything because the Nazis it, could have yes. been focused on, focused on the East. It would have scared off the Americans. No more supplies uh, from America. The Japanese would have changed their strat strategic um, outlook. If it, if it worked, it would have de destroyed the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, if Hess's mission had been possible, it would have destroyed the USSR. Oh, and, and of course, Hitler, 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 Hitler loved these gambles. He loved these bold moves. And there was, it was just yes. Hitler, Hitler's style. This was actually Hitler's uh, style. That was Hitler's style. And what's interesting is that when the news came that Hess had flown to the UK, uh, Hitler went into a rage, right? And and as we study Hitler, most of his rages were play acting, and we know this from various sources, even from uh, from Sir Neville Henderson's uh, confrontations with Hitler when the war was about to begin. Uh, he realized that Hitler's rages were fake, and he even he put out a rage things. of his own. He even rehearsed he this stuff this in front of a mirror. Right, right. He he would rehearse his rages, and of course, Neville Henderson rehearsed his own rage on the eve of World War II, and Hitler was sort of sitting there with his arms folded, sort of sitting with his butt on a table, and he just calmly. Hitler didn't get upset at being raged at, at being accused by Henderson. He just sat there quietly, you know, just calmly, which meant that Hitler was perfectly in control of himself. Uh, these were yeah. these were were you know he could control it when somebody got now when hitler was really angry you know that that was that that happened when he 
lost his temper with Guderian yeah, also, at the end and, of the war. Yeah, and also but, Hitler thought Hitler uh, thought the uh, Hitler thought the the politicians in Britain were super weak and the aristocrats yes. were super strong. And of course, if if somebody like Hess gets arrested and, and interrogated and and and, and whatnot, um, Hitler probably expected this thing to go smoothly. He probably didn't understand. Um, he he probably thought the politicians would not actually get a hold of Hess that much it was that it would they be would kept... respect him as an emissary yeah. right yeah and it, 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 he, and he was an in, emissary of peace Hess would be in safe hands you know with these officers and these aristocrats and it would all work out fine in the end but uh yeah. um this was uh because when when I read um Kilzer's book Churchill's Deception for the first time I immediately thought there should be like multiple sequels to this because there's so many areas that haven't even been uh reconstructed yet because uh because Kilzer Kilzer apparently he's not he, he he doesn't know that much about the older history of the aristocrats and and their ties into Germany you know especially in the 1800s so there were so many families in Nazi Germany that were so old and so trusted and they if you look at these um, family lines you could see general, general, you could see uh, administrator, you could see chancellor, you could see this and this and that. So there was a network, po probably, possibly a spy network that was um, just, just an insane size. And, and they probably had people everywhere at this point. And the thing is, this, this overestimation of the political power of aristocrats by World War II, you had the uh, coalition government under Churchill in the UK had socialists in it. It was uh, oh, yeah. dominated by the bourgeoisie and the, and the working class. Uh, the aristocrats were definitely were dominant when Churchill when uh, Chamberlain was in power and when uh, when Baldwin was in power but the aristocracy had lost its political grip by by the time Churchill becomes prime minister and the third reich is by no means an aristocratic formation the nazi party is is too plebeian it's too lower middle yeah. class to to actually have any true aristocratic leanings so it's a it was a kind of a vein from the point of view of analyzing the aristocracy is a social force that could suddenly change the relationship between Germany and Britain. It was just a fantasy. And of course, in order to cover his tracks, Hitler declared that Hess was insane, that Hess had been psychologically unbalanced for some time. Now, this was damaging because why would the number three guy, you know, if, if Hermann Goering dropped dead of a heart attack and and Hitler was assassinated or something. Hess would be the Führer, right? Yeah. So this is the third I mean, this guy. Was, this is and this was not even this was not even a meeting on neutral territory. You know, when you had, then there were meetings like this during the war where you could just pinpoint a spot. You know, in in in, in Spain or or whatever or some island. They, they had could, meetings in Sweden and Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. You could you could officials. designate yeah. you could designate a, a point in Switzerland to meet and every every side could bring some security forces and everybody would come disguised. You know, with with a fake passport or whatever, and then you could have a talk. But this guy um, Hess, he was he was such a hardcore. Um, uh, believer in his plan, he had a small plane modified with additional fuel tanks, so he could actually go that distance. And if I remember correctly, the final because there was no landing procedure planned uh, per se, so he would just turn his plane upside down, fall out of his plane, and then uh, deploy his parachute. So there wasn't even any sort of traditional planning involved in terms of. Uh, having a safe way out like you would see in other meetings of that. Of yeah, that in nature. fact, he did the flight at night, which was an amazing, it was actually an amazing feat that you, you a madman couldn't have performed it because yeah. you had to navigate when it was pitch dark. He had to fly at night because he would be shot down in broad daylight. People would see him. And then he had to find the, the, the get close to the place he wanted to land. Um and and of course it it ended up he was arrested of course so Hitler had the insanity defense Hess was insane and and of course uh, the the fear was what would the Japanese ambassador say what would his allies say uh, and so on and so Hitler and and of course Hitler had to uh, cover up the fact that he had sent Hess because anything Hess might under interrogation tell the allies. 
might be important intelligence. And if Hess yeah. was insane and had done this on his own, then the the whatever Hess told the Allies wouldn't necessarily be believed, right? Yeah, and also, and also, the British never wanted to let go of Hess. I mean, he was he was in prison no. for a long time, and then they presented somebody. He was somebody. in prison until he yeah. died in like eighty seven, was it? Yeah, yeah. And at some point, at some point, uh, somebody was presented as Hess, um, but his X rays didn't match the actual person of Hess because Hess had a wound from World War One, and that wound was not yes. visible. Was not visible. And uh, so the, the British probably, uh, the British probably got so much out of him that uh, you could never let him out in public. You could never let him tell the story or even part of the story. And um, so, do you yeah, think? So do you, what do you think of the claim that the Hess that appeared at Nuremberg was? Uh, the real <laughs> Hess or an imposter. Have you heard this story? Um, yeah, I've heard that, but I, I I would have to reread some of the literature on that um, to, yeah. to to give an informed opinion about that because it wasn't uh, it it was um, at the time you didn't have biometrics safe for right. X-rays and medical files. You know, teeth, uh, teeth, uh, dental records. It was 1970 or 69 that the British doctor discovered that uh, that the Hess that was in the prison there. Um, the, what's the name of the prison near in Berlin? There, um, I don't remember that name. Well, um, that they kept Hess at uh, after the war. They they would Landsberg. they would Landsberg. Yeah, so they had like the Russians would guard him for so many months, and the British or Americans would guard him for so many months, and they would rotate. Remember, they had that system yeah. for guarding him. So it's th there's a there's a mystery. There's some kind of secret. There's something going on there that has been kept secret by the British, by the Allies, and um, yeah, I mean, not the, the sure Germans, what it is. would be interesting to the, know. The Germans, the Germans were already failing at that point on the diplomatic front, the intelligence front, uh, the war production, and also, um, you know, uh, the British, of course, had their um, Bletchley Park Ultra uh, unit where they uh, were able to break the German encryption that was used. Um, it took a while until the story was told in public, and they told a limited version of the actual story, because um, uh, as we all know, the, the Germans were using the Enigma machine. This looked like an overblown typewriter. You could type in the message, it would scramble the message, and then you could send the message in its scrambled form, and then the other side would unscramble the message to make it readable. Um, and, uh, and and so this was a, a nifty little machine that had all these moving bits and pieces so you could scramble the signal in a very, very complex way. Uh, and so the British were able to um, not just gain access to some code books and some of these uh, newer uh, Enigma machines that the Germans were using, um, but the, German, uh, the British, they also were um, the British were also recruiting some experts from Poland that had started this kind of work uh, earlier. And they could, I think at that point, the Polish could actually break the encryption of the two, the, the two ring version of the, or the three ring version or something like that, or they were very close to it. And so they had these experts. And it's, at some point, the British were making this big machine that could actually um, make these encoded messages readable. But I discovered something else. When I was reading into the Enigma, uh, many experts on cryptography have commented on this machine, and they were very, um, they were very uh, curious about some of these weaknesses in the machine. Because if some little bits and pieces about the Enigma had been a little bit different, the encryption would have been strong enough for decades to come. It would have required um, much more computing power to brute force um, break these this encryption. So why were these mistakes made? And, and that's when I found some interesting links um, of the people who designed the Enigma and who built the Enigma. And I strongly suspect a British spy ring or maybe even a Russian spy ring because with the British you could never really tell. And the spy ring probably uh, implemented these weaknesses into the Enigma Making it easier. So, in other words, the code machine it. was built by people who were some of who were spies yeah. and made sure that it exactly were because built into because it. some of these some of these uh, some of these people they trace back to uh, 
Sweden, some of these people had connections to mm. Russia, because the scientific community was um, still fairly small at that at that point. People knew each other, and some people were working on the same systems. Now, the Enigma was not a, an original Nazi design. It was presented, I think, in the in the in the 1920s. In an earlier version, it was presented in public at an um, at an expo. So here is this company presents this machine and says, this is more advanced encryption that's ever been done. Um, because most countries, uh, even the Americans, they were still using this s- cylinder, uh, this cylinder encryption machine with these um, rotating dials. So you could use that. Um, and it was not an electronic device. But the Enigma was electronic. They were electronic. using those in the American Civil War, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was even, even standard even, encryption uh, machine. Even Thomas Jefferson, uh, in in Thomas Jefferson's belongings, there was a French language um, version of this this uh, uh, cylinder design um, encryption device, and so um, these this company presented this new machine and had all these electronics to scramble the scramble the text, and they were trying to sell it, but nobody wanted it, and then so the Nazis started to buy these machines. And they were demanding a stronger version with a fourth wheel and then a fifth wheel. Um, um, but um, the the British program, I mean, they the the Polish actually bought some of these early machines and they started to work on them, trying to find its weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And and so that mm-hmm. Polish research ended up with the British. Um, but apparently, these weaknesses were built in into the Enigma. Now the estim- the estimations are um, had this thing been designed better the encryption would have would have been good enough on right into the 1960s and 1970s because the enigma was continued continued to be used after the war i mean even the the communists in occupied eastern germany they were still using the enigma um they didn't know that was it was broken um but um it was probably aspiring and uh when we're talking about a british slash german spiring possibly uh, messing up the Enigma, they could also be a Russian connection. So there's there's a possibility the Russians uh, the Russians knew uh, about these weaknesses, and uh, maybe the Russians were able to decrypt the this this traffic well, the, uh, too. The Russians were the masters of human intelligence, and we can talk about the Rota Capella, the Red Orchestra, um, uh, which was the GRU spy ring in the heart of Europe. That, uh, and they called it that because it it would uh, get the information, and it had these uh, different. Uh, I think they called them some of them pianists or players, who would then send the signals from the Low Countries to the Soviet Embassy in London. So they would send the signals there, and of course, from there it would go to Moscow. Um, they would get all this vital information, which. Uh, shows us that Stalin was perfectly aware of Hitler's plans to invade the Soviet Union. And so what uh, uh, what um, uh, more recent historians realize is that as soon as Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union, Stalin knew that Hitler was going to try to invade. And so Stalin was then mobilizing his forces to strike first and of course, who was going to be able to organize and mobilize to strike first in the in the spring of, of 1941 uh, became the race to, of what happened. And of course, who won the race? The Germans are better organizers than the Soviets. They were able to get their act together because they were already at war. They were already mostly mobilized. They had already been fighting. They were fighting in the Balkans in 1941. Uh, they uh, wiped out Yugoslavia very quickly. They uh, closed on Greece. They attacked Greece through Bulgaria, flanked the Greek armies that were fighting the Italians, and rapidly took it, and then did an air assault on Crete, where the British forces had retreated to and won the island of Crete in this incredible uh, air first air mobile battle where there was just an invasion from troops coming from the skies and uh, you know dropping paratroops and seizing airfields and you know, flying mountain troops in behind the paratroopers. Um, incredible victory there for Germany. But again, um, meanwhile, this massive preparation for attacking uh, the Soviet Union was underway. And Hitler would do things like claim that he was faking, he was going to invade Britain, but he was he was faking a, um, a buildup against Stalin 
to fool the British when he was really going to mm. attack Britain. And of course, I don't think, you know, a lot of historians think that this uh, is what fooled Stalin, but I don't think Stalin was fooled. No. I think that it was very important for Soviet historians to depict Stalin as the innocent victim of Hitler's aggression, the naive yeah. victim. Imagine Stalin, the paranoid Stalin being naive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's inconceivable, but this is the, the mainstream history that we're told, that Stalin was tricked by Hitler and got stabbed in the back by Hitler. I mean, this is the guy that's never going to be stabbed in the back. And when Suvorov points out the massive Soviet deployments and preparations, the movement of the railroads, even... Um, General John Fuller wrote in his history of the Second World War, he <laughs> said, we don't have all the documentation yet, but he says, I know this be before Hitler attacked, the Soviets were railing troops from the Far East and were mobilizing. We knew this was happening. So it's impossible that they were, that the Soviets were uh, surprised in the technical sense. What they were surprised about was they weren't able to mass and get ready in time. Yeah. And, uh, there was also this um, thing where the, they didn't know the exact date because initially their spies were saying Hitler would attack in May, but there was too much rain in May. It was too muddy. Hitler couldn't advance. Hitler was also stuck in Greece and Yugoslavia. Remember, the Battle of Crete happened in May 1941. He, he didn't have all of his troops ready. He had to refit his panzers. There was a whole panzer corps involved in and Greece. And the production, the, the war production was was nowhere near where it should have been. In Germany. Yeah, and so Hitler wasn't ready to go in May. The weather wasn't cooperating. He couldn't go in early June. They kept put, they kept having dates where they would attack, and they kept putting it back. So he imagined Soviet intelligence. Well, you said they were going to attack, and I think the first date was maybe May 10th, um, then June something, and it was like, well, they're not doing it. So it is also possible that with these false, you know, because you have perfect intelligence, and the intelligence is saying they're going to attack on that day. Well, the day comes and it goes, and it's like they mm -hmm. didn't attack. What happened with his intelligence? Well, the intelligence was right at the time, but conditions change. So there was uncertainty, and the Soviets were behind in getting ready. So I think that they were, in a way, they were fooling themselves, thinking they could still strike first. Because what Suvorov says is the evidence is, is that Stalin was going to attack Hitler in the first Saturday in July um, because uh, the Germans liked to attack on Sundays and the Soviets preferred to attack uh, <laughs> surprise attacks on Saturdays. And the reason it has to do with the alcohol uh, cycle. <laughs> yeah. Because if you're going to attack on a Friday, you're really getting ready on a, I mean, if you're going to attack on a Saturday, you're getting ready on Friday, which means you've stopped the weekend drinking bout. Mm -hmm. If you wait till Sunday, your army's drunk. <laughs> right? Yeah. No. And you're not going to be ready to attack. You're going to, it's going to not work. So, yeah. so I mean, that, that is the alcohol cycle was, a, I think, a factor in why I've heard this explanation. I don't know, maybe somebody who knows more can correct me but why you know the the russians would attack like finland on a saturday or japan on a saturday so suvorov thought that that it was the first saturday in july well the there the the germans attacked in uh, on on a sunday july 22nd 1942 and um i, I mean 1941 july uh, I mean, attacked June 22nd, 1941. And it was a disaster for the Soviets because the Germans caught their air force on the ground, caught yeah. their troops in attack formation, and they caught the Germans. The, and, and of course, uh, according to Brian Fugit in his book, Barbarossa, the Germans had sent their divisions forward first to send the heavy artillery later. So the artillery was still in the Stalin line, which is back towards the original border, the older border, uh, before they annexed Poland, and they hadn't moved it forward. So here you had rifle divisions without howitzers, yeah. and you had the tank divisions without their howitzers. And so it was a catastrophe for the Russians. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we know this 
especially for, uh, from uh, Rommel when he was experimenting with new tactics in terms of infantry, because he was an infantryman first. This is what people don't remember about him usually. Yeah. Um, he was an infantryman, just like Hitler sort of was an infantryman. That's why they also had his connection. Uh, and uh, even during his infantry days, um, uh, even in World War I, um, Rommel was experimenting because they, uh, they were trying to do things faster they were fighting in different different territories so for example when you're in the mountains you know you uh and you fire machine guns um the the bullets that don't hit the enemy they cause all sorts of rock shrapnel that flies everywhere um and um when when you encounter a little patch of of you know you know the woods if you if you see a, a bunch of trees normally the the uh, infantry manual and the training told you to set up defensive positions and then you know work your way forward step by step but rommel was just experimenting he would fire certain uh certain ammunition into the woods and just see what would happen and uh he was coming up with these new ways and they uh they were really uh, increasing the speed but the equipment was the problem in june of 1941 the germans in 41 the germans had about 3,500 tanks uh, to be deployed, and half of them were quite old. The Soviets had way more tanks, and the Soviets were making 5,000 more tanks every year. The German production only um, the German production was only 3,000 tanks per year, and those were not even heavy tanks. It was only in 1942 when the Panther tank, um, the Type 5 uh, Panther tank was, was made. And so um, this was a production problem. And even, uh, even some of these generals were complaining a lot about this. Uh, and uh, the decisions were made for certain operations based on the available equipment. So um, Halder and von Brauchitsch, they wanted to resign over all of this. And uh, Hitler was the the master of excuses. So when he would have these one-on-one -on -one meetings, oftentimes with his generals, the general would come in and explain the situation, explain the problems. Hitler had already made up his mind, and he would tell a pre-prepared, rehearsed excuse. He was telling one general, "Well, I need those tanks to give them to Rommel." But then he would tell Rommel, "No, I need these tanks somewhere else, and so you're not getting as much as you actually need." And so this was kind they of they also a, they also reorganized the Panzer divisions for Barbarossa. In the invasion of France, there were two Panzer regiments in a Panzer division, and one uh, a motorized infantry regiment. Um, in Barbarossa, they changed it so that a Panzer division would only have one Panzer regiment and two motorized or later mechanized what they call Panzer Grenadier regiments. So that um, th this is this is rather uh, a, a curious, and of course, um, this is curious. So it meant that the Panzer divisions had fewer tanks. Um, and of course, there were tank, there was, I think, one tank battalion uh, assigned usually to one of the infantry formations in a Panzer division, but um, uh, it 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 was um, it was fewer tanks. It meant that you only had instead of four hundred tanks per division, you only had two hundred tanks per Panzer division. Um, I uh, sorry, even less than that. Um, but I think that's approximately right uh, because the there what there wasn't actual uniformity in all the divisions, but. Um, uh, so that there were there they could make more panzer divisions so that w when they invaded the soviet union they had what they had was four uh they called them panzer groups two in army group center and one on each of the flanks and we should mention that uh when germany invaded the soviet union germany was going to have finland that had been bullied by the soviet union join in in the north and Romania that had been bullied in uh, June of 1940 and had territory taken from it, Moldova, for example, taken from Romania, uh, would join the Soviet Union to extend the, f the front. And German 11th Army was, uh, I'm sorry, 11th Corps was deployed to Romania. Um, so there was this, um, so this was, this was part of the, um, 
the Barbarossa operation, but the main German armies were positioned in, in, in um, Army Group North in East Prussia, Army Group Center uh, just east of Warsaw, uh, and Army Group South down uh, in, in what was what would before been southern Poland, so southeastern Poland. And they struck out in three different directions mm -hmm. from this uh, at, at beginning and of course made incredible gains except for army group south that got checked in the in the south army groups north and center made tremendous gains and uh, so tremendous that it it looked like literally the german generals were ecstatic and thought we've literally won the war in the first two three weeks of yeah. the war and that was and that yeah and that was the reason why um uh, such strange decisions were made regarding the uh, the war production. Um, so, for example, um, Albert Speer, Albert Speer was talking about this aspect a lot. He said that before 1942, uh, ammunition was the ammunition production was fluctuating a lot um, because um, it, it was just increased before a blitzkrieg uh, uh operation and then the uh the uh, ammunition production was lowered again and uh imagine this um the 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 german army goes into the soviet union in 41 but it took until 1942 uh to have the ammunition production be uh continuous Right to to have um, you know multiple shifts work around the clock, and uh, and just keep pumping out these um, these these uh, artillery shells and other. We, uh, we, we should ammo. we should mention Fritz Todd was a minister of arma minister of armaments and munitions before Albert Speer, and I think didn't he die in a plane accident after visiting Hitler in 1942? Right. I think so. Yeah. And what's really peculiar, and I don't know what the speculation you've heard, but I've heard the speculation that that uh, Fritz Tott was assassinated. He was killed. His plane crash was arranged. Now, that's a theory uh, that people have. Um, and, and Fritz Tott, I believe he built the West Wall, right? Just before the war started, he was the one responsible for that. He was like an engineer. But apparently, he was not terribly effective um, in doing his job. And is it possible that Hitler couldn't fire him or somebody got rid of him? What, what have you, from the German side, has anybody made these kind of suggestions? Well, usu well usually the, the speculation revolves around personal liking and uh, who this person was connected to. So um, if, 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 if there was a personal connection, um, that could have made the difference because, um, because Hitler made these choices um uh all throughout this this period and also sometimes it's simply um if you had powerful friends if you had the right friends that were close to hitler that could also um change a lot because remember when albert speer talks about the dynamic around hitler when you uh when you um made mean jokes about someone and hitler would laugh at these jokes this would set a process in motion where Hitler would lose trust in that targeted person. So you couldn't have a discussion with Hitler. You couldn't say, well, let's have a chat. You know, this guy, I don't like him. He's not competent, blah, blah, blah. Hitler wouldn't really bite on this. But if you started to make these subtle jokes and, and you just cleverly insert some, some things into the conversation, you would seed an idea. You would just seed an idea and watch it grow in Hitler's mind, you could actually torpedo somebody's career. And at the same time, with these techniques, you could also um, keep somebody's uh, career going. So that's... Now, kind of now uh, Fritz Tott uh, had, if I'm remembering right, had a big argument with Hitler just before he got on that plane at Rastenburg at Hitler's Wolf's Lair headquarters on the Eastern Front in East Prussia. He had had this argument with Hitler. Uh, and I'm not sure we know what the substance of the argument was, but um, but it was uh, it was described as as rather heated uh, at the time, and so um, and and it's very funny. Albert Speer was personally at the Wolf's Lair when this accident air accident happened, where Todd died. So did somebody tamper with the plane and 
I think if the night before, if I remember right, the night before, Taut and Spear were going to fly in that plane together. Mm. But Spear decided to stay there overnight and because he was tired and he canceled joining him. So they both would have died on the plane, yeah. which is, it's all very suggestive. And of course, I don't think we know, and I don't know what the, I've never seen the report on the accident, what happened, but um, su the suspicion of an assassination centered on Hitler as the person who was annoyed at him didn't want the confrontation of firing him and so just decided well we'll kill him mm, it was probably right? there was probably even a, an assassination attempt against speer himself because he he te he tells a story of how he got sick very very much so um very quickly and then he was in you know during his medical treatment at some other place um, he was already losing access to Hitler, which was devastating. Like people like Martin Bormann, they always stayed close. They never took a day of uh, took a day off. So Speer was outside of Hitler's um, circle, and then um, he, uh, Speer was told that uh, somebody was planning to mess up the medical treatment and get rid of Speer because Speer had many enemies, even though. Speer was yeah. just ambitious. Speer was just ambitious, but not overly ambitious. He always had the overall situation in mind, and and uh, because he was he was he was an architect by training, right? So, um, and for a long time, he even didn't he even didn't get a salary for for a while as an architect, and so he wasn't as as hyper ambitious as these other people uh, that that he had problems with, and. Um, so he was um, he was watching how one million soldiers were lost in Operation Barbarossa. This was in in forty two. So again, the 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 war production was not good in in, in nineteen forty one. It was not good enough in forty two. A million soldiers were lost, and only then did Speer get the the uh, the permission to change the the ammo production to have a continuous ammo production and also using all the industrial techniques to make these things faster he was able to increase the output by 60% without using more labor without using more workers he was demanding f he was demanding more workers but he didn't get them most of the time and he even got some weird feedback from within this crazy incompetent nazi circles uh for example um when he was assigning uh engineers to to have more uh decision power right he would just give these people more decision power because they were able to do their job properly he got some negative feedback and the feedback was this is too american you know this this you know this style that you're you're using. This is too modern. This is too American. We don't like it because we're we're being very traditional here. And um, by that time, of course, the American uh, the American industry was hyper powerful. Um, but they were still you know talking in these terms on German you know in Germany, saying that we don't want America an American style here. You know if 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 you don't have that background. If you don't have that party standing, you shouldn't be able to decide anything, even though the engineers were able to make better choices. And uh, if you demanded more workers, these Gauleiters would protest because these Gauleiters, they had all these you know, ambitious projects, you know, building, building uh, uh, new, new city blocks and making all this stuff and, and raking in all this money. So they didn't want to give up their workers to produce ammo for the war that was going on and already a million soldiers were lost. So this is, again, this insane psychopathic comedy show that was uh, Nazi Germany at the time. And um, Well, I, I should also, the, the elevation of psychopaths in the Third Reich, and it's a problem in the United States, in the Soviet Union, modern states elevate psychopaths and and of course there's the theory that Speer himself arranged the assassination of Fritz Todd. That's one of the theories that Hitler didn't do it. Um, therefore there that is Speer and and of course there is Yale University Press has came out. I read the book when it came out in 2017. I actually read it twice because I found it uh, disturbing. It's called, it's Martin Kitchen's Spear Hitler's Architect. It's a very long book, 
but it really depicts Speer as a pathological liar, as a malignant narcissist, or maybe even a psychopath. Um, and it, it, it is like many of these Nazi biographies or biographies of Soviet or Chinese leaders, uh, modern communist leaders, uh, you become sick to your stomach as you read about this guy, how he behaved how he depicted himself always he was the artist of depict putting himself in a good light and other people in a bad light i mean he's always his image is always central but the actual core of albert speer was very dark he was efficient there's no doubt he increased this efficiency but uh, part of it was smoke and mirrors this biography argues because he was a man of 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 cultivating an image um, and so made the switch, right? He, they didn't hang him at Nuremberg, but if they'd known what he had done as armaments minister, the way he treated uh, the yeah. brutal treatment of the, of the laborers, of the forced labor, they would have hung him, right? If they'd, if they'd had an well, honest he was, telling. He was super detached. I mean, he, was, um, he made sure he was um, in front of a desk, you know, sitting on a chair. And that's something um, that we also saw from Hitler. I mean, Hitler made these decisions, you know, signing some document, um, you know, just getting a lot of people killed, um, shipping people in the concentration camps. Hitler was making these decisions on his desk, but Hitler would, uh, Hitler would always... Um, Hitler would always stay away from the carnage. Um, he was terribly afraid of it, and he he was reportedly having uh, you know p signs of PTSD from World War One. Um, he didn't want to see the carnage, and many people in the Nazi leadership were like that. And uh, there was this disconnect between the generals and the political uh, the political leadership, um, because it's it's one thing to sign these orders; it's another thing to actually. Uh, to, to do that and of course these generals are protesting we should um, treat these people better in Poland we should treat these people better in Ukraine because they could help us against the Soviets but the decision was yes. always made to uh, to go another way and massacre people and just antagonize them there's some there's in, an interesting in, in, new book in, um, yeah yeah this uh, important Walter Schellenberg's memoir talks about how Schellenberg said why don't we treat the Russians better why don't yeah. we treat the Poles better um, and of course, he could get nowhere with Himmler or Hitler with this. Yeah, there's a there, there's a fairly recent book out in Germany. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure if there's an English translation there uh, yet. But this is about the um, this is about Erich Koch. He was at first just um, oh, he was a monster. Well, Kilzer oh, talks about Koch in his yeah. in his book Hitler's Traitor that Koch was possibly a Soviet agent. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and so yeah. uh, Erich Koch initially was just responsible for um, a a back backwater you know. Uh, part of Germany it was not prestigious, and it was a fairly small area. But as the the uh, the the Nazis Head of advanced, Ukraine. yeah, he became he was running Poland at some point. He was running Ukraine, large parts of Ukraine. Uh, so he became the territorial master. He was administrating the largest piece of Germany uh, that that there was, and so and he, he was, was incredibly brutal to the Ukrainian people. Exactly. So when when the yeah. Germans when the Germans. Uh, when into Ukraine, they were initially celebrated by these Ukrainians because they had high expectations. Um, there was this this common ritual where they would greet these Germans with, I think, with salt and something else. Uh, and uh, but the decision was made to uh, treat them as harshly as possible, kill about twenty percent of them, um, if possible, and and so this completely turned. Uh, or limited the ability of, of yeah, the military. And, and, you know, this was this was Hitler himself. And, of course, Kilzer makes the argument that uh, Martin Bormann was egging on this dark side of Hitler, yeah. as well as other Soviet agents. Um, uh, I mentioned Heinz Linge. Heinz Linge was present when Hitler was shown mov movies of the Ukrainians greeting the German tanks with flowers. 
And uh, Linga writes in his uh, memoirs that he was in a position during the filming to watch Hitler's face as he watched this. And Hitler made faces. Hitler did not like to see the Ukrainians greeting the German soldiers, which is what you would think. You would be ecstatic. Oh, they love us. They yeah. want us. We could. But no, Hitler did not like it. And uh, in no uncertain terms, Linga said he just had this set. He hated Slavs. He hated Jews, you know. He had these these racial prejudice, yeah. Which was that, then the the communists could use that because the communists. What's interesting is that the 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 communists assassinated successfully the the head the Nazis put in charge of Belarus oh, in didn't, Minsk. And didn't uh, didn't Alfred Rosenberg spend time the the you know ide ideological Rosenberg guy. was sort of the boss of the whole yeah. thing of the whole occupation area yes yeah and, and and Rosenberg he was sort of the the ideological guy and didn't he spend time in Russia didn't he have a, like a Russian connection and, uh, he was born in the Baltic he was a Baltic German okay I think yeah, he was I born he in I think, Latvia spent, or I think he even he even spent some time in Russia for that matter. But I mean, yeah, he was educated in Moscow. I think I think he really? went to university in Moscow. Yeah. And uh, Erich Erich before Koch before it um, became Soviet. Yeah. yeah, and Erich Koch ultimately he botched, probably intentionally sabotaged um, the uh, the the retreat of the German yes. population when the Soviet army was advancing and all was lost um, because all, all the historians that looked at it knew that an early evacuation could have saved many lives, but he botched it. He expressly uh, uh, for, forbade people to escape until the very last moment when escape was almost impossible and the rush either the russians would get you or the cold weather would get you. And so there's um, yeah. even uh, my, my wife's family Uh, my wife's uh, family, they come from that specific area and they have the memories of uh, that particular uh, escape. So uh, they were grabbing their children, toddlers, babies. And uh, there's there's like uh, my mother's grandmother, I believe it was. Um, she was, the grandmother was um, was carrying her, uh, the youngest child, um, the I think that's my mother-in-law. So uh, grabbing the baby, and there was this the smoke everywhere from from burning buildings and everything. So they were just escaping by on foot with these little carts. And so by the time they got to and safety, and this was what December or January? I'm not sure yet, but it was it was crazy cold, and the baby was just covered in 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 soot basically, mm. and everybody everybody thought that the baby wouldn't make it, but ultimately uh, it, it it survived. And then when they came on on their escape, um, they you know because when you when you when you try to escape, you find these these different places you can sleep. Usually, it's these farmhouses. And there was a, f uh, a farmer family that wanted to buy that baby from them. They were offering them mm -hmm. money and for the baby because they, they, they desperately wanted one. And uh, they promised them we will take great care of that baby and we have land and money and everything's going to turn out fine. Um, and they desperately needed the money, but they kept their child they kept their baby so imagine if, no, if the you're, Russians if you're were going to reach that farm too yeah exactly and if you yeah. run I mean if you're on the run you have you're on your foot you're on foot and you just grab carry what you can um, and and you desperately need funds you need resources and somebody's offering you to buy your baby your, to buy your that's kid that's terrible And uh, so, terrible. and that was the intentionally botched um, evacuation due to Erich Koch, and he himself had already um, shipped shipped his uh, his Mercedes limousines and some of his artworks, and he was already stashing the stuff on ships to to bring it to safety while everybody else was not allowed. He to, was going to um, flee to Sweden. Was it? What? He, was that where he was um, going to go? I think so, and ultimately he was he was himself forced to uh, steal a bicycle or buy a bicycle and just run and have a fake identity, and ultimately he was caught, though. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of those Nazis, even Schellenberg, who fled to Sweden when the Sweden had to cough him up later, uh, a lot of the Nazis, um, they thought that they were safe, they were going to be safe. Um, Uh, but yeah, it, it's so this war in the East, we've got this, uh, this Hitler invades the Soviet Union has tremendous success 
in um, in conquering. And in fact, uh, the fact that Army Group South is delayed in the South actually led to a greater victory because German Army Group Center passes the flank of the Russian defenses down around Kiev and then just simply swings south. And Hitler had to actually trick his generals because they didn't want to do this. The greatest victory of 1941 was when Hitler tricked his generals by dividing Guderian's command into going south. And they trapped 67 Russian uh, Soviet divisions in the south. Only the three cavalry divisions got away because they could ride out on their horses. But everything else was trapped. And it was, the I think, the biggest uh, battlefield victory where the largest number of troops were captured or destroyed, I think maybe in history. Yeah. Because it was uh it was a it was a huge force. It was this is over this is, you know, seven hundred thousand to a million men yeah. were trapped in this pocket and and most of them taken prisoner after the tremendous victories of the North where they had pocketed uh the uh the initial uh, Soviet armies near the border with uh, with uh, between the Third Reich and the USSR. So this victory was gave them all gave Germany all of Ukraine, all of the Soviet Union up to Leningrad, which is now Saint Petersburg, and uh, the German generals had always been Moscow, Moscow, Moscow. If we take Moscow, the war's over. Just like if you take Paris, right? It's over with France. They think that this is the big thing, and it they might have been right. Uh, Stalin was evacuated Moscow, and Hitler finally said, well, we're so far ahead, let's just, and all of the panzer armies then were, panzer groups were massed in the center to go to Moscow in the, starting in late September, early October, oh, God, and of course yeah. they got delayed by rain. And they kept the advancing. Mud. And in fact, yeah, it was the crazy it, it was mud. The mud was, yeah, it like saved with the Russians. Like with Napoleon. But they, they had within the first two, three weeks, they had destroyed, the Russians had a line of 600,000 troops. They had captured or destroyed half of that line. So they were even then with the mud and everything, they were just den annihilating the Soviet army. Um, do you and, remember when... Um, do you remember yeah. when when the, uh, the 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 American lend lease program really got into gear supplying the Soviets? I don't remember exactly when that. Uh... Yeah, well, they were actually we were actually supplying them before we got in the war. In yeah. fact, this is brought up. Diana West brings this up that uh, British uh, uh, military equipment destined for Singapore that would have strengthened Singapore against the Japanese, and American equipment that had been airmarked aircraft airmarked for the Philippines, were rushed to the Soviet Union in 1941 this is before pearl harbor so that the philippines part of the reason why the philippines were under strength was they had sent some of this equipment to the russians and the same thing with the british they everything they wanted to send because russia was collapsing so fast everybody thought if you were you know in october 1941 if you were a military analyst you basically thought the soviet union was done that's how bad it was in fact in, it was either late October, early November 1941, that Stalin told Lavrenti Beria, the head of the secret police, uh, start looking for some other country that could take us in as refugees, take in the Soviet government, in other words. Where would we go into exile? That's how bad it was. And in fact, Stalin gave an olive branch to Hitler, offered to negotiate uh, a peace deal. And Hitler did not Hitler was like, no, I got this. You know, mm -hmm. there's no reason to negotiate with Stalin. He probably should have, right? Yeah. But there was no reason to negotiate because it was a done deal. And, and of course, the attack on Moscow was a pincer that was going to come in from both sides. And, of course, what happened to that pincer movement? Two things happened. Stalin knew Pearl Harbor because of a spy in Tokyo that he had. Sorga, um, was it? Or... Sorga, yes who was a German diplomat who had been long secretly converted to Marxism, who was working for the Soviet government. He knew he was an, he was great at sleeping with other diplomats wives. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was able to, in Tokyo to find out everything that was going to happen in the far East. So he found out about Pearl Harbor, but of course it was operation snow. Stalin had tried to set up Pearl Harbor. Stalin had a task 
Harry Dexter White, the deputy head of the Treasury who was really operating the yeah. Treasury, to provoke the Japanese in this cable that, that would make them – give the Japanese – not only humiliate them, but give them no room to kind of save face which you don't want to necessarily do with the Japanese. And this created an argument within the Japanese military structures where suddenly the U.S. was embargoing Japan because of its occupation of French Indochina in 1941, embargoing it of oil and, of course, metal, things that Japan needed. There's no oil in Japan. There's a little bit in Manchuria. But most of the oil Japan got was from Indonesia which was below the Philippines, and they would have to travel past the Philippines where the Americans had air forces and an army under Douglas MacArthur. And of course, that would, that would cut Japan. So the Japanese had to take the Philippines, which means in order to make the way free, and that meant, well, we might as well attack the American fleet in Hawaii. And that was all set up, and it was Operation Snow. There's a book called Operation Snow. I recommend everybody to read it. Of And, and why? Because what was Stalin's greatest fear? That that army, the Kwantung army in Manchuria, would invade Siberia if he pulled those Siberian troops back to Moscow. Well, once he knew that this attack was going to happen, that Japan was going against the U.S., he could pull those troops to Moscow. So Moscow was beginning to receive reinforcements from the Far East of these divisions that had, were fresh, that were sitting there. And also on December 5th, the temperatures dropped. They had record cold temperatures that dropped to 40 below zero in the front around Moscow on December the 5th. And that was so cold, the Germans had not winterized their gun oil. Mm -hmm. or their petroleum. So that meant their equipment was disabled by the cold. The cold was not only did it yeah. cause 160, 70,000 frostbite injuries in the armies that were attacking Moscow, it destroyed their equipment. Yeah. And also the yeah, the whole um the 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 whole equipment was not winter ready for those kind of temperatures. The clothing, it took a while. I mean, a while until the uh, troops were issued this They called it the Charkov parka. This was a, a long jacket um, with uh, fur, I think, on the inside uh, as well. Uh, I think it was rabbit fur. And uh, it took a while for soldiers to actually get this. And many men were lost um, because uh, the, the the very air was killing you. So if anything, if any any part of your body got exposed, uh, this this was extremely dangerous. And uh, the the diesel fuel, the oil, none of the equipment was really uh, suited for yeah, that kind and, of environment. And gun oil is sensitive to temperatures too. You have to have yeah. oil in a gun to get it to function properly, to, to reload and, and fire. Otherwise, it'll jam up. So you have to have gun oil. Well, if the gun oil itself is compromised at those temperatures, guess what's going to happen when you go to fire it? And also, some of the, the metal becomes more brittle. That is, its yeah. strength weakens. So you have the you have howitzers that can explode. Yeah, you have even, machine guns. Yeah, that sometimes don't work. even when you, for example, when uh, when you when you install the barrel of uh, an AK-47 rifle, um, professional gun makers they will actually freeze the barrel because it would would become I think slightly uh, smaller. Then they could install the barrel. Um, but imagine if, if all your equipment, if all of your equipment is is in that that condition, um, and also the just the the general armaments. I mean, the Hitler was Hitler was demanding that the soldiers were using these old style bolt action rifles because that's what Hitler knew. He hated modern technology uh, in in many in certain certain areas. Um, sometimes he thought technol weapons modern weapons technologies were Jewish science. You know he. Uh, He didn't like certain technologies, uh, and he would he would issue these old style rifles when um, when uh, they had a new assault rifle ready to be mass produced. I think it was the Sturmgewehr 44, the 44. This was pretty much like like any modern assault rifle. It had an, an intermediary uh, intermediary sized um, uh, bullet. So it was not a it was not a regular pistol bullet, but it was not as big as a, the average rifle bullet. So you could carry a sizable amount of of, uh, of ammo, and um, and you would have the the semi-automatic fire, 
and you could use this rifle in, in distances of up to I think 400 meters. Um, this this was also not implemented um, at that stage. No no uh, strategic bomber force, um, and so this became a nightmare on so many levels. And even in the winter of 1942. The command structure of the Nazis became even more silly, even more dysfunctional, because at that point, you could only get access to Hitler uh, through uh, Bormann, Keitel, and Lammers. And the way this worked was, um, you had to submit, uh, you had to submit this request to talk to Hitler, and so uh, Bormann, Keitel, and Lammers would. Uh, you know, just get the information about what this general or whatever wanted, they would come up with a way of telling a story to Hitler. They would pre-brief, um, pre-prepare Hitler. They would already make the decision with Hitler and then the talk would actually take place. So information was flowing to Hitler through these guys and it would flow from Hitler mostly through these guys. And we know f almost for certain that Bormann was a traitor with the Soviets, Bormann was probably the agent codenamed Werther. And the way this worked was um, there were several of these high-ranking moles and they would send the material to uh, another person. He would send it to another person. This was, um, it ended up with a man called Rado and he had these uh, these radio operators that would then radio that stuff uh, to the Soviets. And the material that Rado received was um, sorted into categories. So, for example, that information came from Agent Werther. That information came from the other agent, and then so on and so forth. So, um, this was a a not just not just about stealing information, extracting information out of Germany, especially about the war, where the troops are going to be, how much um, ammo they have, how much reserves they had. Not just taking these these inf taking this information out of Germany and bringing it to Russia, but they would also bring influence from Russia to Hitler. And um, yes, it was it was yeah, really Yeah, Bormann was influencing Hitler in a demonic way, and Hitler already had his demonic side, of course, as we know. Um, and so it it wasn't that difficult to uh, do provocations that would get Hitler to do things that were really against Germany's interest, but of course appealed to this crazy side of this crazy murderous side of Hitler. Um, I should should now that we're discussing this this winter of forty late forty one forty two well it's autumn of forty two when this winter strike happens this horrible first winter uh, a very disastrous thing for Germany happened in addition to this and that was uh, that damaged in terms of the, the German strategic efficiency damaged the German generals who you know, had operational art of war, had the skill, had shown themselves to be very skillful warriors versus Hitler because a panic happened among the German generals, Brockage, Halder, um, the commander of army group center, um, General von Bach had a, like a, a heart attack or a nervous breakdown. A lot of the German generals started, I mean, they were exhausted physically mm -hmm. from this, the, the, the campaign into Russia already because they are going at this massive pace, as you say, speed is of the essence. So these guys are, are not sleeping. They're putting in tremendously long hours. And then this winter strike, this unexpected 40 below weather that's killing men and wounding them and making the equipment not work. They were in such a panic. They were telling Hitler, we have to retreat all the way back to some of them said all the way back to Poland. Right, we've got to get out of Russia because yeah. it's we're all going to die. It's like the, they had the syndrome of Napoleon. They're all reading mm -hmm. that famous book by that uh, one of Napoleon's um, officers. Um, I read it years ago. I can't remember his name now, but it was the account of Napoleon's being army being caught in this premature winter where you know the horses f got frostbite. They then had to pull the men, had to pull the carts and so on. Um, they, they had this vision of the destruction of the Grand Army was going to happen to the Wehrmacht, right? And Hitler 
was very was correct in this one thing you don't retreat you dig in you stay in place if you retreat it turns into a rout hitler had this one piece of understanding of prudence that if you retreat you'll have more frostbite casualties you will lose your positions the russians will kill you on the retreat dig in hold you know they did withdraw an army group center. They had to withdraw into where they could actually get better supplies and the men could get warm. Um, but they, but Hitler said it's the, the st stand order, stand fast. And Hitler proved to be right. The front held. A disaster didn't happen. The German casualties weren't greater in December then in fact it was a lower than average casualty rate because the retreats were judicious and the um even fired uh general von runstedt for giving up the city of rostov and falling back to what he thought was a more defensible position and runstedt was probably correct of course he brought runstedt back um later but um because he was caught he was an old world war one general that that he was like in his 70s um but it it was um it, it, it was th this embarrassed the generals, Halder and Brockish. These generals, now they had egg on their face because they panicked and Hitler held the army together. So that meant that Hitler now could run the war without the military professionals sort of having the final say on things so that Hitler could get his way on the overall strategy. And this would prove disastrous in 1942 when Germany renewed the offensive. I mean, would you basically agree with this? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the the um, this I mean, even before the 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 Operation Barbarossa started, um, Hitler would um, take certain generals out of circulation. He would retire them. He would uh, change things around and he would continuously change personnel even though uh he oftentimes didn't even know these uh generals that well so and he would by the way he would bribe generals he would give them estates he would give yeah. them huge cash rewards this is something that has not been discussed generally about world war ii history is that hitler would would win the the basic loyalty of these generals by making them super wealthy people yeah. like guderian um, you know, generals, these generals were given, you know, land and money, you know, yeah, and to of course, keep yeah, them loyal I mean, course, to Hitler. There's, yeah, I mean, there's also an, another element, I think, to this. Um, and this is also something we see in Russia now with the Ukraine war. Um, yes. The, the families, the families of the generals, because they, they usually have multiple children, they have wives, and they uh, they are, they can either be, you know, benefit from the bribes you know they live in bigger houses and the children have bigger careers but it also goes the other way if if you lose hitler's trust um this could have disastrous consequences so again it's this it's this um limiting of decision power limiting of influence and everything at some point ran through um bormann keitel and lammers and keitel of course he always keitel always did what hitler told him he was the one who would um who would uh, uh, just just uh, trash other generals and agree with Hitler over and over and over again to the very end. And uh, he's also a character that needs to be looked at more closely in hindsight. Because, he was hanged at Nuremberg. Yeah, title. but we we need to look further into this guy and, and his connections because um, there was always, I mean, people talk about the assassination attempts against Hitler and how they failed and, and, and so on and so forth. But there was always, always, always the the option of killing Hitler because um, yes. Bo Bormann Bormann basically was responsible for Hitler's surroundings so the the service personnel the personal assistants the places Hitler lived in there was always a way to poison Hitler uh, there was always a, a way to um, uh, to kill Hitler even subtly you know if if you poison Hitler just a bit he would be unable to continue his work so he would have to hand over command to somebody else so and, and think about it Stalin's agent Bormann was Stalin's agent if Stalin had wanted to kill Hitler there he had Bormann yeah. as an agent he could have done it couldn't he exactly exactly now there's there's yeah. um I have this this book over there I I recently reread it it's from a German guy he was I think in the defense uh the the defense ministry um uh during the cold war 
and he wrote this he wrote this book under a pseudonym about uh, energy weapons um, related to uh, the Havana, the the Russian energy weapons, you know, the Havana oh, syndrome, yes. the Moscow signal, and so he was he was writing this in the in the mid eighties, and um, he was he was interested in in the Nazis, um, and he suspected that for various reasons, he suspected then that some form of radiation was used against Hitler, and of course suspects like Bormann and others, uh, especially Bormann, because. Uh, or even even Albert Speer himself, because these people were responsible for the buildings that Hitler lived in, his personal quarters. They could hide stuff in the walls. They could hide microphones. They could hide maybe something that emits radiation. They could do whatever they wanted. And also, this is something that um, that people misunderstand, I think, to this very day. When we talk about Hitler's doctors, right, because they had to give him amphetamines, they had to give him all kinds of stuff because Hitler had such ADHD, he couldn't focus really before the war as much. But when he was on these amphetamines, something that you would give to a person today with ADHD, Hitler was able to work all these hours. And, uh, and so people looked at the official documents that survived of Hitler's uh, doctors and they were not noticing anything too unusual. But all these people said that there was no clear record keeping of any of this. So um, if... Uh, well, Dr. The, Morell was not... Yeah. Dr. Morell, who gave him his syphilis treatment, his little pills, um, there was something wrong with him, wasn't there? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was it wasn't just him. It was uh, another major doctor as well that Speer was describing. And um, these historians, when they looked at it later, they assumed they expected to be uh, they expected Hitler's fluctuating health. Um, they expected it to correspond to how the war went. So they imagined if the war was going well or something turned out to be better, um, they expected Hitler to be more healthy. And when the war was not going well, they expected Hitler to be miserable, but it was exactly the opposite. It was exactly the opposite. Whenever something went well, Hitler was feeling terrible, like he was about to die. You know, his his digest digestive system, anything, it was completely out of whack. Oh, yeah, he had terrible digestive, which is also a syphilis and, uh, symptom. He and, had and also, terrible and so, digestive so, um, so, um, it's So, for example, this German author, his pseudonym was uh, Paul Chartis, but he wasn't the only one. Some people suspected that... Uh, some agents, some assets were uh, manipulating Hitler's health to influence his decisions because we know Hitler was an occultist. Hitler was having all these weird ideas that you know uh, he could he could um, that sort of these forces were talking to him and giving him inspiration and probably somebody had the opportunity at least to influence Hitler that way. So when Hitler was making a certain decision, he would immediately feel better. So he may have believed that fate was on his side again because he made that particular decision. So Hitler could have been killed many, many times over. And if the British, oh, yeah. if the British had actually given a public statement about not intervening in Germany, if there's a civil war breaking out within Germany... Um, Things could have gone very much in a different way. Oh yes, um, very. In fact, uh, and in fact, Stalin had a lot. Still, even in the midst of the war, he had a lot writing on Hitler. Hitler was his guy. He was the ideal enemy for Stalin because there was Bormann right at Hitler's elbow, manipulating everything so that Stalin could not only win the war, but he could get to Berlin. He could get to the heart of Europe. Yeah. And, suspect, and get the lion share of the spoils. I suspect. Uh, I suspect that the Russians were the Russians were able to recruit Martin Bormann through some um, aristocratic intermediaries. So you have these aristocrats who are Russian Soviet agents, and uh, and they these 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 middlemen probably recruited Martin Bormann early on because. Um, uh, Bormann was a young soldier in World War One. He was almost too young at all to to join the war. He didn't see any any fighting, I believe, because of his age. And then he got hooked into the aristocracy in Mecklenburg because those were his commanding officers. And then he rose up in this uh, early Nazi system. He joined early. He was in a Freikorps battle group. This was sort of an irregular, extreme right wing group that was fighting. You know communists that were they wanted to, to have their mini republics 
And, uh, and so he was rising up in the Nazi system so fast. And, uh, he was he the was, deputy of Rudolf Hess. Yeah, he was. Um, he, and he, people in public oftentimes didn't even know him at all, or they, they didn't know a whole lot about him. They always expected Hitler to, to make all these decisions, but they didn't know much about Bormann. So uh, I think the, this, this, uh, some of this uh, Mecklenburg aristocracy was recruited by the Soviet intelligence, and they were able to recruit people like Bormann, because that's the pipeline you would use. I mean, from the Russian perspective, that's a perfect way of uh, recruiting people because the middlemen, they are, they look perfectly German. They they come from old families. They look perfectly German. So um, a guy like Bormann would trust them, and uh, and that became sort of a, sort of a massive, massive problem. And um, uh, so Keitel, who was heading the the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, like the uh, what do you call it in English. Um, sort of the okw yeah the it was the the leadership of the of the army um wilhelm and then Keitel, there was a, a upper commando here's group yeah um, um wilhelm keitel uh he came from a very simple background and he was marrying into a family that owned sort of a larger property in hannover and hannover of course was the the origin of the modern british uh british kings and uh, and Keitel was always agreeing with Hitler, and Keitel was working on these other generals um, as well. So I think we should look into Keitel. We should look into Hanover because if Soviet agents or Russian agents got into these places, Mecklenburg, Hanover, that's of course a disaster of historic proportions. Um, because the, the the Nazis understood the Nazis to a large degree, understood counterintelligence as killing Jews, right? So if you kill the Jews, because they believe Jews had this magical ability for subversion and, and wrecking empires, so they thought killing Jews equals counterintelligence. So by killing all these Jews, they thought they've done a really spectacular job they, they, at counterintelligence. Yeah, they, yeah. But but the problem is if if Soviet agents got into um you know Soviet agents got into Hanover and Mecklenburg and Schleswig-Holstein you're screwed. I mean you're completely screwed. They wouldn't they wouldn't even notice it. Yeah. No, no. they I should mention uh Himmler's Posen speech which uh, they have the original copy of the tape recording of it which is the I think it's the only recording of a Nazi official admitting the Holocaust. Mm. Right? And it's at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. If people want to go there, but it, you can you can actually listen to it online. I believe that there's a versions of it you can listen to on. Um, but but uh, it was a speech. I think it was given in September of 1944. And uh, this is what Himmler says in the speech. He basically says the same thing you just said that the that if they did not if they had not rounded up the Jews if they had not eliminated the Jews or 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 done this Holocaust, they didn't use that word. He said if they hadn't done it, the Jews would have done the same thing to Nazi Germany uh, that that they did allegedly the stab in the back in World War One. Yeah. So and the also, Germany yeah, and also wouldn't the, have been able to stand up. Yeah, and, and also up, right? and also this this traditional conspiracy idea that uh, Jewish intelligence circles, you know, the elders of Zion, right. that these Jews had taken over Britain uh, and and took ta had taken control away from the the old rulers, and um and this I mean even before the Nazis were around, this was kind of the prevailing idea. This is also what you saw in modern conspiracy literature. Apparently, Jews have these magical sub subversive um, abilities. They can almost perform miracles. Uh, and so you cannot just deport them. You cannot just round them up and put them in these ghettos. You have to physically eliminate them to to provide this this level of counterintelligence. Um, but um, even Canaris, the, uh, the intelligence uh, the intelligence head, Canaris, he even said, our, our armies, they will bleed to death on the I, the icy plains of Russia, and after two years, there was would be nothing left. That was uh, the the idea that Canaris um, had had about this. And um, yeah, and, and Canaris was always working uh, to try to bring an early end to the war if he could, yeah. working against Hitler. And he covered uh, his yeah, he covered his own. He, he covered his own butt when he uh, assembled or had a report assembled um, before the before Operation Barbarossa, where he estimated the Russian capabilities and the the 
problems of the Germans because if if this all went wrong, he didn't want to be resp held responsible. He could point to his earlier report that was on record and say, I told you so. Yes, yeah. Canaris was very smart. He was he was one of the most brilliant. In fact, the Soviets were more afraid of him. Uh, Soviet intelligence was more afraid of him than any other leader of intelligence in the world. Why? Because they knew that he was wanted the wanted this germany to make peace with the allies and wanted to not be defeated by the soviet union and if he brought an early end to the war then the soviet armies wouldn't make it to berlin and vienna yeah and this is one and there, that was yeah there was this one episode in 1943 that was a, a very important year in the war this is when things started to shift uh, uh tremendously so in 43 canaris had a secret meeting in istanbul he was meeting the american diplomat george earl who was a friend of u.s u.s president franklin roosevelt uh yes. and uh, so he was he was making all these kinds of suggestions um hitler was supposed to be hitler was supposed to be killed or retired and uh, and so the these remaining leaders in Germany they they were you know intended to make peace and end the war and all that. So Earl was uh, typing up this report about that secret meeting, uh, sent the report to the White House, but there was no answer. So what do you think about R Roosevelt's role in this? Well, Roosevelt had the same problem Hitler had. Uh, his health was bad, like Hitler's health. And the man that was around him all the time, Harry Hopkins, uh, I believe, I think it's credible that Harry Hopkins was a Soviet agent. And Diana West makes the case in her book, American Betrayal. And um, there was a researcher named Marx, not M-A-R-X, but another Marx, who uh, did a study of who the... Uh, Agent 19, we had the decrypts uh, that we had uh, broken the Soviet code. I think it was a, a captured Finnish code book was given to us. And we were able to decipher the Soviet encryption uh, from their embassy in Washington. And so we were able to read their intelligence cables. And we had, I mean, it was a matter of just, you know, it was a mass of the stuff we'd collected that we hadn't all decoded. But in 1943, it was determined that within, now the White House staff during the war, I mean, there were thousands of people working for the White House, but there were, it was determined there were 224, um, I'm sorry, 324 Soviet agents in the Roosevelt White House. Okay. And one of them was Agent 19. And, and Marx had, had done an analysis of who, what, they had the cables with the information. Where could this information have come from? And some of it was from a allied meeting in Canada that Roosevelt attended. But the only person that could have been American who was there for, the, for that information was Harry Hopkins was at Roosevelt's elbow. So Marx determined Hopkins had to be Agent 19. Uh, and his analysis, uh, there were later other historians claimed that Marx died, unfortunately, of a heart attack. Um, I think it was a heart attack or a stroke uh, suddenly. But he had, uh, there were people who claimed that just before his death, he recanted this, which is completely false. He never did recant it. And Diana West has kind of shown this um, along with uh, some uh um, M. Stanton Evans, who wrote, um, who who wrote, uh, was a co-author of the book *Stalin: Secret Agents*, and of course wrote the book on McCarthy, uh, blacklisted by history. But what's fascinating is is that Harry Hopkins's role as co-president, which the press described him as a co-president with Roosevelt, was extremely important to Stalin. Hopkins was the first American representative of Roosevelt to go and meet with Stalin and make all these promises to him, meet with Churchill, develop the Lend-Lease. Um, Hopkins was this ultimate troubleshooter with the prestige of speaking for the president. Um, and of course, Hopkins was caught by Hoover helping the Soviets with espionage. It was in 1943, I believe was the year, the FBI had discovered the Soviets had penetrated um, 
part of um, the um, the Manhattan Project, which was the project to make the yeah. American atomic bomb. They were they were running part of it. Part of it was running out of UC Berkeley, and they had detected there were Soviet agents that were in this this Berkeley part of it, and that they they were onto them. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI had called Roosevelt at the White House, but he got Harry Hopkins on the phone because Harry uh -oh. lived at the White House, and he said, "Look, tell the pre you know he said the president he's not feeling well, he can't come to the phone." So Hoover said, "Look, tell the president we found these Soviet agents." infiltrating UC Berkeley, the Manhattan Project, it's very important. He needs to know. So what did Hopkins do? And this is well documented. He goes to the Soviet embassy and tells them that oh. the FBI has found out about them. <laughs> and of course, he's confronted. Oh. Hoover is furious. There's an extent letter from Hoover, you know, basically calling uh, him out, uh, calling uh, Harry D um, Hopkins out on the carpet about this and saying that, um, you know, he ran to the, we know he ran to the Soviet embassy with this. This is a breach of, and Roosevelt defends Hopkins because Hopkins said, look, the Soviets are our allies. They need to know that yeah. they made this mistake, right? Oh, boy. Is that crazy? Oh, <laughs> it's boy. crazy. So, uh, this was in the situation. The front line was 3,000 kilometers long. What's that in miles? That's like uh, 2,300 2, miles. miles. It's, it's yeah. 2,000 miles. Yeah, Roughly 2,000 2, miles. front line. Yeah, running from um, Leningrad on, this, on the Gulf of yeah. Finland all the way down to the, to the Sea of Azov and in the, the south, which is the, off the Black Sea. The supply lines became also increasingly large and even when Barbarossa started the uh the the railway system was not good enough uh they couldn't even process all these trains and so um well the the problem was the Russians ran a different gauge of railroad they had yeah, wide gauge yeah. railroad tracks so the Germans had to literally replace all the rail tracks with the <laughs> narrower European gauge tracks so um yeah so then of course the infamous uh situation with Stalingrad, that became a disaster. The sixth German army was almost uh, enclosed. Um, 220,000 men, 100 tanks, 1,800 large guns, 10,000 other vehicles. Uh, Hitler wanted them to continue fighting. And almost the entire uh, battle group, what do you call it, um, Heeresgruppe A, uh, was about to be encircled. And then and, ultimately yeah, that's, the... Uh we should explain how Hitler did this disaster, how he made love to this disaster. Um, because he had been right the previous winter in holding the line, he ended up being able to make the whole plan for 1942. And Hitler thought he wanted the oil in uh, Baku, in the Caspian oil. And so he, th he had this idea of creating another army group, Army Group A, which was had a lot of panzers in it. It was going to go all the way across that desert north of the Caucasus, this, this just open prairie, basically, go across that and invade the Caucasus and get all the way to Baku and get, get that oil for the Third Reich. That was crazy. That was a, They called it a safari. Mm. They made the joke. Um, and at the same time, Army Group South, 6th Army leading the way, was going to go to Stalingrad and which was just on the uh, the west bank of the Volga River, and secure that as the the main you know sort of like a, a main hub, a rail hub, you know, decisive for controlling that part of Russia, to control that, and then to use the Don River, which which the Don comes close to the Volga near Stalingrad, but it, then it veers to the northwest uh, to Voronezh, and to make a line there. To protect the flank of this whole thing so this was the plan they were going to have this tremendous advance they were going to take this oil it was crazy operationally mm -hmm. any of the you know halder or brockish any of the old generals would have looked at this and said this is insane because you you are stretching the german line to go way way south for that oil with a whole army group that instead of fighting the Russians and destroying Russian armies all summer is doing nothing but marching all summer. 
doing nothing because the the Russians just basically had light defenses in the south and the Caucasus, and they just basically withdrew. Yeah, and the, then you are concentrating on Stalingrad, an urban area, to capture the. You, you're over concentrated here. You're under concentrate. You're actually having Romanian armies, two Romanian armies protecting the flank of this huge concentration of Sixth Army on Stalingrad, and you've got your most powerful army group doing nothing but marching, marching, marching. So this is a this is a recipe for the. Dis- defeat of the German army in yeah. in late 1942. Yeah, sixth, uh, just to set that up. Sixth army capitulated and um, the, yeah, of course the And the, on the February, urban, what was it? February 3rd or 4th, 1943? I don't remember that date. It's it's just yeah. the nightmarish urban warfare that took place um, and I would suggest people people grab a good book about uh, Stalingrad and and this level of urban warfare because, I mean, many militaries nowadays, they expect urban warfare to become a much bigger factor. Um, Ultimately, it was a situation where uh, tunnels were dug, um, you know, people were making holes and punching holes into walls and they were creating all this, almost like a rat's nest. They called it a rat, uh, a rat they call it rat warfare because it was like a rat's nest and people were using flamethrowers uh to clear these these tunnels and and to uh to move into the next building or you know to move into the next room using flamethrowers it was just a miserable super miserable type of warfare and uh the the average soldier of course um didn't last that long uh some of these tanks they couldn't fire that that high up to to catch all of the you know, people that are in the building or on top of a building, so it was it was just um, uh, you know problems problems with the equipment um, all all around and uh, just the the amount of ammo that was used was also draining German supplies and uh, and at some yeah. point at some point of course the uh, the German main territory was uh, bombed by the Allies you know the British. Um, uh, the British bombing, so they constantly had to shift production around, and some of these facilities that were hit, um, they were were uh, processing ball bearings. So without <laughs> ball bearings, you have no war, you no know, war making maybe making capacity. This became a nightmare uh, at home when uh, you know the these facilities had to be shifted and and things had to be moved underground and. Um, just to supply these troops. Now, constantly in Russia, um, the supplies were never enough to have a, to conduct a proper operation because the generals would always estimate what was needed. They needed X amount of this and X amount of that, but only a fraction of that could be provided because of these long supply lines and uh, problems um, associated with that. Um, then, of course, there was the humongous Battle of Kursk, this was when two million soldiers battled each other. I mean, that that sheer number is just mind-boggling. You know, when I mean, there used to be a time when when an entire force was just you know a million each, but um, or or in that dimension. But this was a, a battle, a single battle where two million soldiers were fighting. Yeah, each we other. should mention uh, that's later in '43. We should mention the other disaster that happened in '43, which was really the uh, equal to Stalingrad, and people don't talk about it much. It's when the Germans lost their army in Tunisia, which was always a strange thing. Uh, Rommel had lost the Battle of El Alamein and had a 2,000-mile retreat back from from uh, Egypt, um, where Italy, El Alamein that, is. Italy, the Alps. And, and he, yeah, he had to retreat all the way back to Tunisia, where Operation Torch, in November 1942, the Americans and the British invaded French Northwest Africa, which was part of Vichy France, and they captured it. Uh, they, they landed at Algiers and in Morocco. And the Germans at the same time came straight in to Tunisia, which was close to Italy, close to Sicily. And for, when Rommel retreated from Egypt through Libya, they gave up Libya, which was the Italian colony in Africa that, that really caused the Africa Corps to come in and to rescue the Italians after Graziani's army was destroyed in, in late 1940. They, they, uh, they, they created this huge army in Tunisia. And of course, the Battle of Kasserine Pass was Rommel's last famous battle where the American, I think it was the American Second Corps, was defeated by Rommel uh, decisively. But um, 
but then Rommel left Tunisia. Avantama, I think, was left in charge. And But they had loaded it up with all these troops. They had a, a whole panzer army now down in uh, Tunisia. But but they had no way of uh, – the Allies had such air and naval superiority. The Germans couldn't keep it supplied. And, and, yeah. and so they lost at the same time – the, you know, within a, I mean, this was in uh, what May of 1943. Um, so in February, you have Sixth Army defeat the biggest army in the German armed forces, and then you have this the Tunisian army with the Italians and everything that's lost. The 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 amount of people they could evacuate was just, I think, a fraction of what they had. So um, maybe you could comment on that a double disaster in the first half of 1943. Well, people have always wondered why not much effort or why such a limited effort was made uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, the entire Mediterranean area, because uh, the British the British had their strongholds there, and um, and also the uh, the supply the supply situation became uh, an issue because of these um, Bletchley Park ultra intercepts decoding the Enigma, so. Um, these ships supplying fuel for Rommel's tanks. These ships were sunk uh, quite often, and so the British um, had an island between Italy yeah. and uh, uh, the main center in uh, uh, in, in Libya was Tripoli, yeah. and um, they they had Malta was like in between Sicily and Tripoli, and they could use planes and ships to intercept the Italian convoys. Yeah. And this devastated Rommel's supply line was not reliable. And also there's there's another element to this. Um, people sort of remember that after World War II, um, there was a uh, a very strong, very strong, very large communist movement in Italy. It was already there, of course, yes. d during yes. the war, before the war. And so, um, especially uh, during the Cold War, the Italian Communist Party was, I think, one of the biggest communist parties in it, the world. It was the biggest communist party in, in, in yeah. the West, in NATO. It, it, yeah. dwarfed, it dwarfed anything else uh, that we saw. And, um, and so, uh, the, these, of course, these communists then uh, tried to gain political power because they had been involved in... Uh, certain operations, but I think not enough research has been done on the role of the communists in Italy, because Rommel was relying on Italy uh, to a large degree, and uh, and um, with these uh, with these Italians, you know, some of them had a connection to Britain, and uh, uh, and some of them there was just this mass mass communist infiltration of Italy, and this was not properly addressed. Um, and so yeah. also this the whole... Italian officer corps and the uh, the royal family were British connected or had British sympathies. Yeah. So the yeah. Uh, this this entire the entire Mediterranean region was of course then a mess, uh, you know, for for the Germans, and um, and in this in this whole um, in this whole effort, the goal was always to cut off the British, you know, just to get rid of the British in in that whole area. And at some point, the British even anticipated they might have to leave uh, some of these areas that they were involved or have been involved in for so long. Um, but ultimately, this this came to nothing, and and Rommel had to make this crazy retreat going through Italy, uh, through the Alps, and this is even when. It, the the power changed the the, the leadership changed in Italy, uh, and it, and Italy flipped ultimately. So his supposed yeah, helpers became enemies. Yeah, it was the invasion of Sicily. Yeah, in July 1943, the U.S. and Britain invaded Sicily. Uh, the Eighth Army and the U.S. Seventh Army landed, um, and it was uh, the U.S. Seventh Army was led by Patton, of course, and the Eighth Army by Montgomery, and they had uh, after the the German surrender in Tunisia, uh, Sicily was logically next. And what happened was, and Hitler knew, had enough knowledge of what was going on in Italy, he knew that if if the island of Sicily fell, Mussolini's rule over Italy was imperiled. And of course, that's what exactly happened. The fascist council itself deposed Mussolini after the defeat in Sicily. And and uh, the king announced, the king of Italy, they also had a king aside from Mussolini, they they basically started to negotiate 
to to surrender and to flip sides. And Hitler had an operation. You may remember the name of the operation to to have enough German units positioned in Italy to be able to intern the entire Italian army overnight, you know, in a fortnight, which is what they were able to successfully do. And, of course, take them to prisoner of war camps uh, in, in Austria. I think in Austria, maybe it was in Germany. Yeah. And so, and of course, the, the Americans, they had um, the, Amer the American intelligence, they had a connection to um, to some of these these crime families in Sicily. Um, because they yeah. knew all the ports, they knew the ports, they knew the territory, they had contr some sort of control. Um, but during the Cold War, you know, these crime families, they also seem to have Russian connections. And that... that they, the Russians went out to, to control organized crime. Yeah. yeah. They went out to control it in the 1950s. They studied it and said uh, organized crime is a key to political intelligence in the West. So they decided yeah. to infiltrate the mafias to where now the Italian Parliamentary Committee of Inquiry into the Mafia told, this is in David Remnick's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Lenin's Tomb, told David Remnick that um, Russia was now the capital of international organized crime, coordinating the three major Italian mafias. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so But in that time, in World War uh, II, the mafia was helping America, uh, especially with yeah. Sicily and being also, the first target. After after the war, um, this sort of this some of these Italians they uh, they increase their activities in the United States, and of course, if there's a Soviet connection to that, that means now you not just have Italian organized crime in the United States, uh, but you also have you know Russian infiltration in the United States, and of course, this goes into into um, the FBI's history, uh, Hoover, and and the attempts to. Uh, to deal with this this whole situation uh with with the mafia in uh uh so when everything was was going downhill for the for the germans um hitler was um hitler was demanding that uh, uh prince philip of hessen come to the headquarters uh together with princess mafalda who was the daughter of the italian king and uh mafalda had sent Uh, encrypted uh, communications to Italy, and uh, the king, the Italian king, had had Mussolini arrested, and so uh, Hitler was sending both of them, or he had the intention of sending both of them to a concentration camp. So this is sort of the the late stage uh, of that game when he was becoming so he was becoming more aware that he was surrounded by enemies traitors or just people who wanted um a different outcome there were people who wanted to uh make peace with the russians and keep some of the territorial gains and just find some sort of a deal before the americans land uh, uh again you know with uh, in the normandy the, the d-day invasion operation and, and of course before that the american the first landing on the continent of europe by the allies was of course salerno which happened after this was, uh, well, uh, Montgomery's 8th Army had crossed at Messina, the Straits, from Sicily onto Italy, but, and he was slowly, it's very narrow, boot of land, he was slowly coming up there, but the, but the uh, British and Americans launched an amphibious invasion of Salerno, and it was a very touch-and-go battle. The Germans almost won that battle. Um, Uh, because of certain mistakes that the Allies made, but they were learning, and it, it was their second major amphibious operation in, in, in the European or the European theater, Mediterranean, actually. So yeah, so it's uh, so we're getting into uh, 1943, where Germany's on the defensive, and you mentioned the Battle of Kursk, which of course happened in uh, July of 1943, and we should maybe discuss uh, Prokhorovka and the. The, what John Mosier says happened there, which is interesting, uh, different, because I think the Russians have mischaracterized the Battle of Kursk. I think Mosier is correct. They've tried to make it sound like a victory when they were really had their face smashed in. Um, they really suffered a horrible setback there. But because of what happened in Italy, Hitler had to withdraw his best super divisions Uh, SS Panzers and others to co go to Italy because it you can't just hop on a train and go. It's really an ordeal mm -hmm. to move a Panzer division 
all the way from the Russian front to Italy. And so they knew they needed armies and they needed really good ar good troops in Italy to face the British and Americans because the British and Americans were qualitatively better troops than the Soviet troops. And yeah. so they needed these divisions. So maybe we should start with that next week and then we could finish the war because and the aftermath got, the aftermath of and the, the aftermath war. yeah because we got we got we just got through the middle of world war ii and we're almost done three hours here so we want to keep it below and three we hours haven't, we haven't talked about china yet because china was a hot zone at the yeah. time yeah and yeah uh, well, we, we 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 might need to do another show about to, the pacific and how the communists got control of China after the war in the wake of the way the Pacific War was managed. So we should talk about that because how did the communists win so much? I mean, Lenin's idea, remember, was there was going to be mm -hmm. the second war and we were going to control Europe and we they could get control of the Far East. Which See? they did to and some And they degree, did. Yeah. They got China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, out of it. Not right away, but they they arranged everything so they did. And we should probably talk about the mystery of, um, you know, the Battle of the Bulge at the end of the war, the mystery of G uh, George, General George Marshall, who later was accused by Senator Joseph McCarthy of, he didn't actually accuse him, but he indirectly suggested there was something wrong with George Marshall, that George Marshall had helped the communists. And I think there's some more merit to Joseph McCarthy's uh, bill of indictment against Marshall than we would think, especially when it comes to Operation Olympic against Japan and the Battle of the Bulge. So we can cover that next week too, because it, it really, it's at the end of the war that Stalin's control of Hitler's government. And we should also talk about Schellenberg's memoir about how there's a civil war going on within within the elite of the Third Reich between the Soviet agents and the ones that want to go with the West within yeah. Germany, that this was already developing uh, in the Third Reich. And that you had the same thing in the United States with the massive infiltration of the Roosevelt administration by the communists, which was revealed then after the war by the by people like the, the, the House um, uh, Un-American Activities Committee and the testimony of uh, against Elder Hiss by Whitaker Chambers and Elizabeth Bentley and Louis Boudens and, and many others, which led to the Senate hearings, McCarthy Senate hearings, and the Army McCarthy hearings. So all of that is connected to the war and what happened during the war. Exactly. Now, with this, this of course, then uh, the the aftermath of the war leads us also into China. That leads into, uh, of course, then the Korean War, which was a major, major incident. And uh, uh, and then uh, we're gonna move forward through through the the Cold War period. Um, go through Vietnam and, and all the other uh, major conflicts. And, a lot uh, of le myths and legends there to break down because a lot of yeah. the things people think about these wars are just not true. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, this is going to be uh, the, the next episodes. And at some point we can just uh, fluctuate between, uh, you know, central topics or just um, – current events uh current stories you know that that came up in during the week um there's all sorts of all sorts of uh, important things that need to be said um and also it, it also integrates very well because when we look at the situation now we may have a world war pretty soon uh people should really know about the the second world war and the first world war and in the wars you know like uh, for example, in Korea and Vietnam, because this is all very important. Now we see some more mainstream productions. I think there's a, a docu series now on Netflix that's fairly new about the Cold War. The mainstream will do more about this, but it's it's never going to be really deep. It's never going to be really uh, never going to be really about the intelligence level of it, which is uh, almost a decisive factor when it comes to these things. And people have talked about. The tanks of World War II and the, the the airplanes and just the ideology of it, but they rarely really touch on uh, the intelligence the intelligence level. And you made some really important um, comparisons between 
uh, the Russian planning back then and the Russian plan the Russians uh, plans now. You know, this they plan ahead. They they envision they envision these conflicts and and make these necessary preparations, especially on the information front, because they wouldn't go to war if they didn't have all this propaganda in place. They are literally inside people's heads, even in conservative heads. Uh, uh, they've managed to do that, and this was something we also presented in in the show today this was also the case with germany when all these right wingers had ideas in their heads some of these ideas came directly from russia like the protocols of zion mm-hmm. yes right yeah no the the tools of intelligence and strategy they go together and the russians are the masters of psychological warfare and information warfare and uh, perceptions management um if you can manage your enemy's perceptions you can misguide his strategy and you can you can do all kinds of things you can divert his attention away from what he needs to be paying attention to you can get him to attack objects that are not necessary you can bring other parties into the war you can delay your own entry into a war so you're stronger this is what stalin did both in the european theater and especially in the Pacific, we'll see that Stalin maintained his non-aggression pact with Japan clear up to 1945. Yeah. <laughs> and then stabbed Japan in the back uh, by invading suddenly Manchuria in uh, August of 1945. So um, it's about the same time the atomic bombs were being dropped on Japan. So these are all things we will cover and um, how the Russians really take advantage. Where they win is intelligence, diplomacy, and d- despite their military bungling, they make it work. They they basically leverage that to make battlefield victories too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, and also when, uh, when we talk about the 1940s and then the 1950s, uh, also the role of... Um, Lord Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was a supreme Allied commander, you know the Asian theater, and he, I mean, he was involved in bungling China, uh, definitely when um, th- when the, the support when the nationalists were no longer uh, supported and the Chinese took over, and then of course the other things that that Lord Louis Mountbatten did, and you know we know now about um, uh, Mountbatten's Soviet contacts, and we know about his Soviet leanings and 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 the ideas that he had, and he was the guy who uh, presented his candidate, uh, Baron Hastings Ismay, as the first Secretary General of NATO. And now we are left with a NATO organization that has had its own infiltration problem. Now the Russians they always tell you that NATO is a Nazi-like behemoth, um, but it's it's very far from that. It's it's just um, um, a situation that that persists to this very day. And we feel that in Europe, especially when Germany barely has an army to speak of, the French um, have have large issues with their military. And this is now in the year 2024 when the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans could strike at multiple points uh, simultaneously. Yeah, we're we're in a pre-war. A lot of people believe we're in a pre-war World War situation now with China and Russia. And um, I think that's that may be exactly correct because they've been just like they prepared 20 years in advance with Lenin's strategy for World War II, the second imperialist war. They have been preparing for a long time with their long-range strategy and their deception strategies and their, their what, you, what you would call their culture war. They've been preparing this for a long time against the West. So uh, everybody, thank you for joining us for this part two of World War II, part three next week. I am Jeff Nyquist. I'm in the United States Alex Benish has been my co-host. He's in Germany, and it's kind of nice to have somebody who is an American and a German to discuss World War II, and we hope you'll join us next week.